art forum that we're doing together with Asia Democracy uh, Network and Asia Democracy Alliance with the kind um, uh, support of the government of the Republic of Korea. This Kathmandu Democracy Forum is organized by Asia Democracy Network, the Permanent Secretariat of the Community of Democracies, the NGO Federation of Nepal, in partnership with Development Alliance, Asia Dalit Rights Forum, Global Call Action Against Poverty Asia, Migrant Forum in Asia, and again, with the kind support from the government of Nepal and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Korea. We begin today with session two. In session two, we're gonna be, um, CSOs will be presenting monitoring reports from Southeast and Northeast Asia. Teams will present their findings on research conducted on respective countries in the framework of SDG 16, which also consider the impact of COVID-19 on human rights and democracy. The moderator for today's session is Mr. Ishal Supriyadi. He's the Secretary General of Asia Democracy Forum. Ishal, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Patricia, um, for nice introductions. And then I'm joining you to have a warm welcome for the everyone's presenters and an audience who are um, uh, watching this broadcasting online to our uh, YouTube channels. And I guess as a patriot said today, we're going to listening or learning and then discussing uh, finding from seven countries, I, I guess five from Southeast Asia and then two uh, presenters were representing two countries in Northeast Asia. I think it is uh, quite important to giving very wide uh, coverage of this research that yesterday we listening uh, South Asia and of course a country from Central Asia. So perhaps today we will like to hearing and listening uh, the situations, the update situations related with SDG and 16s on, uh, uh, related to human rights and democratic, democratic situations. So lining up here in, on my list, a presenters um, uh, from Cambodia, Indonesia, the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, Japan, and Mongolia. Uh, actually on the, on the lines, Cambodia should be the first, but because uh, for the uh, important appointments by the Thailand presenters that need to attend another important meeting with Asian civil society uh, forums that also happen in the same times, I would like to uh, making exceptions and then please excuse uh, the arrangements. And then I would like to call uh, Thailand's representative, Mr. Don Tajarun Suk, from the People Empowerment Foundations, or PAP. But before you start the presentation, I would like to call attention for everyone. Uh, you have like a 12 to 15 minutes maximum of presentations. Okay. I would like to call attention when the time reaching uh, 12 minutes. And then I really wanted to make a, a hard call uh, when you're reaching 14 minutes to conclude your final presentation within one minute. So. This is to allow everybody to, ex, uh, to have similar expressions and also to make efficient timing managements. Then we can have ample time to have discussion uh, after all the presentations. At the same time, uh, the secretariats also providing uh, opinions or questionnaires for the audience as well as for the presenters. The questionnaires should be uh, display right now in your screens. While you're watching and listening the presentation, I would like to kindly invite everyone to fill up uh, the questionnaires. And this will be very helpful for uh, serve material and the further discussions. Without further ado, I would like to call Don Tajarun Suks from People Empowerment Foundation of Thailand to presenting the finding within the Thailands. The floor is yours, Don. Over to you. Yes, thank you, Ishan. So, good afternoon, everybody. So, let's I share my screen first. Okay, everybody, I hope you see that. Okay, uh, thank you for the forum. So, to so inviting me to, to, to be part of the 
the, this the monitoring report. So I appreciate that. So as we have 15 minutes now, so I will start that as soon as possible. And then I try to say, talk really slowly. Normally I talk really fast. So if, if some, some part is like, you, you, I talk too fast, you can like keep away from me. Okay, let's see it next. Okay. So in, in case of Thailand, so you can see on the, the data, I get to you the table. So you can see that it's like, actually the first case of Thailand is start on January. And then like during the February and March, so we, we still have the, the like low number of the infected case of COVID-19. But if you see like really significantly on April and May, you see the number of the accumulated case is so going really fast from 42 to 1000. So this period I could call that infection spreading. So, but the Thailand is really good like with taking actions like to control the, the pandemic. So it's mean after May, we, we could say that this, this is a situation that Thailand can control the situations. And then you can see the number of the, the case is going so slow, really little. And then the debt is very really stable. It's like, it's one country have the lowest uh, debt. And then the Thailand also get the, how to call that, the first rank of the, oops, sorry. The first line of the the progress, no, to control the COVID nineteen in July by the the global COVID nineteen index. Okay, and then this like the chronology slide. Of what happened in Thailand? Really, what an important event in Thailand. So, I will go quite fast. Actually, Thailand like in the parallel of the COVID nineteen, we also have the big demonstrations. We I think many people know that, right? But it's starting in the February 21, when the, the one party, the new party is like dissolution by the constitution court. And many young people like they vote for this party and they feel like it's not like fair for them. Like it's, and then the start demonstration national by led by the student and go and government start have on the margin to have like the stimulus fund to like, how do I say, to let cover the, the economic situations to help the people who can suffer from COVID-19. No? And then during March 26, the Thailand start uh, have the, sorry, I, I could not see my screen. Can it? So the state emergency is like government we uh, have state emergency on March 26, and you can see this part is also extending every month until now. The end of October is still using this state emergency, and government use the lockdown. Lockdown is for like uh, social distancing, work from home, and then curfew time. Like people cannot go out. As it has had the relaxation at least six times in Thailand. And then for this part, the impact of COVID-19 to the people's life, actually they have the two impacts. The first impact is the dialect impact and the government response impact. So let's start by the dialect impact. It's like when we have the COVID-19, people start have the social panics, right? What happened next is like people have the social discrimination, stigmatization, like to the homeless people and also Chinese people. And also they have panics on the food, like the least people are buying a lot of food. So that's why the, the, the poor people cannot access to the food and some business it close. And it's also direct to the health program, like in Thailand, the end of August. So we have like 3000 cases and then 59 dead. And the most problem in Thailand actually is the government response impact because is impact to many problems you can see now. If you go quite far here, like poverty problem, mental problem, violence. So actually, because of the lockdown, so it's mean like it affect many people on like social economic problem. So and then massive unemployment. It's not just only unemployment, but it's like have effect to the other problem like hungers, right? Inequalities, homeless, 
And in case of a Thailand, we have 59 people who died from the COVID. But actually, the suicide rate, you see, at least we have 2,500 like people acting to suicide because of economic problem. So I may go across this part. Let's see for a bit now. See, COVID-19 so impact directly to people, but the government response also impact many in a social context. Okay. In, in the term of democracy and civil space, you know, uh, government have declared the state emergency. That is uh, on March 26th, right? And until continue, until now, it's still going on. And ruling the state of emergency, so government have like all decision making. So it's mean 60 body, like the one who take the control and like all decision making. But on the October 15, it's like they have serene state emergency because of the uh, political demonstrations. So people, uh, government use that to control the people and exactly because of the COVID-19. So we have many problem uh, effect on to the SND freedom of expressions. So some people use the online media channel to like express their voice. And also, you know, government also banned the the one Facebook pages are called Loyalist Marketplace. The way people, young people use this Facebook to discuss about monarchy and governments like ban this page. And also the government use lab, it means use the, the law to restrict the political movement all around the country. And they also have like the problem on the, you know, during during the COVID-19, they have the mask and then government, some government, some people who close with the government, they can import and export. Do think people need masks to protect themselves? So maybe I might go very fast on this. You can see, we so affect other problem also on democracy, you know, it's state. Let's see on government's response. Actually state emergency for me, I think this really important also because government can take quick response. But the problem is sometimes people use the state emergency as a pretext, the reason to stop to the political movement. Lockdown is also nice. Coffee is also nice. So she this sign is really good. But those, the main uh, government policy is like impact people on socioeconomic, like massive employment. This is a big problem actually, yes. And uh, government have many like policy during COVID, no? like the, they're going the center of COVID, CCSA, like to update the new every day and then uh, in, in any perspective and both across for stop foreigners to come to the country. But you know, they, they also like stop the border, but Thai people, some people cannot come back to the country because of this policy. So this will affect many things. Yeah? And then let it go. Uh, government also have stimulus fund to, to, to keep the 5,000 baht for one people for one people for three months. Uh, partially they can help some people, but you know, uh, because the registration system, they should use the, 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 the phone, the computer to registration for this kind of, to get this fund. But many, many of vulnerable, they, they, do, they do not have any like, some people do not have any phone, the good phone to use to registration. So they cannot access that. Also my grand worker, refugee, they could not access uh, to get this fund. And government also have many fun actually, but yeah, right. Some people can get that, but many vulnerable could not get that. Okay. So maybe you can see the other issue here now. Nah? So I, I don't mention anything, right? So for assessment about government, uh, like respond. The, the good thing like I mean have, oh, I, I did some wrong spell, but uh, have many capacity to do that. And they have many volunteer to help. And Thailand, we have strong like food production supply. So it, like we, actually we have many food during COVID-19, but people could not buy the food because of economic problem. And uh, the weakness is like government doesn't have the, the sense of human, human rights, I think, because uh, they do not mention anything about refugee and migrants. Like really, they really favor the burdens to to survive in doing this situation. And because of the equality gap is so high. So it's mean, uh, some people like can help themselves, some could not, right? Equality is like 
it makes government difficult to help other people. And then another problem of Thai is also democracy because during 2017, it's like we have the, the new constitution started by military. And then it's lack like of like people participation. Okay. And about what is the oldest one, no? Most of the time, like because of state emergency, so government, so they, uh, government take take audition making, but right. But CSO, most of the time, what they doing, like they just help the vulnerable, where the where the government could not access to them, like we distribute the the handy of box is like to keep to like the box now and sharing the food together, and then vulnerable can go to get that. And I I, I found that it happened. We have this kind of boxes. It's like anywhere in Thailand, and then contributed by CSO and also the communities all together. And some organizations giving them shelter for the people who like could not like to pay their housings, and then they have to leave the home. Some organize giving them job to work because one level, you know what they want? They want money. They want job for their sustainable life for a long time, right? And then with government, they make crowdfunding. So, okay. And also, right, we keep like medical supply and masses, then hand gels, nah. And also, CSO also like expressing democracy in any way what they can do, you know. Most of the time, they use online channels. Mm -hmm. But after July, it's like after the pandemic, it's like state can control the pandemic. So people come out to the state and then go uh, start the portrait skin on July and then until today, every day. Mm -hmm. And then some oh, yes, also make the video not to the media channels, like to do the campaign and then giving the policy suggested to the government. So at, uh, for the point of, for the assessment of CSO response, they have the strong, like the good way of them, they, they understand need from the people, especially from the vulnerable. And then they can like really cross with vulnerable. But the problem is like the lack of capacity. What I found that is like some organizations, small organizations, what they can help just maybe one or two communities, but they could not help like many communities. They can do just uh, what they have, you know. And I also have the proposal for to and the recommendation to the government. So, uh, like the urgent problem now is like government should understand what the problem of vulnerable, and then choose like resolving uh, the economic problem for all the people, not even Thai people, but all my grants and like all vulnerable. And then the democratic system, nah, they should reform the constitutions because the constitutions, we need the democracy, democratic system which like can have our voice. We can like explain our voice and like into the policy making body. And one problem is like, you know, like government doesn't have the data of the, about the people when, you know, when they need. Like for 5,000 baht, when they want to, to do registration every time. So it's mean the government, government doesn't have the, hello, you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and you have two minutes to go. How many, how many time? Two minutes. Hello? Okay, I'm all done. So like government should have the strong system like can identify people, you know, like to have database of the people so they can like when they have some problem so they can work immediately. And then the long term they should reduce the pattern of social inequality in all dimensions. And I, 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 I let's commend them for social welfare system because ensure that all people have been protected, will be protected. Okay. And for international organization, as I say before, it's like people have problem on lack of, no, CSO have the problem on like lack of capacity. And then many funding from international is like, just keep like the, them for the one project, small project, you know, but what they want actually, they need like the long-term sustainable in, uh, funding for the core fund is like, they can work like flexibly, okay? And they should have some like mechanism like in the more between work together, CSO, international, and then uh, even government, no, on the ACG. And then all, all mechanism now, we should improve that to be more inclusive and all for stakeholders. For especially on ASEAN, you know, like I feel that ASEAN doesn't have much action. They just, uh, they have many like, even we have declaration, 
on the COVID, but people doesn't don't feel that it's like ASEAN have any effective in this way to the or dealing with COVID nineteen. And then the the ASEAN actually it it doesn't have the mechanism for people. So so I I I I just suggest that to change the ASEAN charter to open for more people participation. And yeah, I think it should have the long plan for regional corporations to help all vulnerable for all people. Oh, so CSO, right? Okay, so normally like in, in the, we should work together what we have done. So we have keep continuing and keep to protect on a liberal rights. On us, even as in health problem, we have to keep work with them. And then I promote the democracy. I, I suggest that for democracy and social welfare system for us in to ensure that all people will be protected. And then for global, maybe I mentioned before, right? Okay. International corporations for all like stakeholders. Now, and then still engage with international human rights and SDG mechanism, okay? So I will stop here. Actually, I have to leave now soon because I have to be translated for the next another meeting. Right. If you have any question, please send me an uh, email also. And then I, I think I, I, I will come back on 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 five p.m. if I if possible. Okay, Ishan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm not um, sure, but if possible, I will come back. Okay. Yeah, let's see if you are still here. But I think. I think we, we almost concluded the time. Well, anyway, thank you, Don, for your presentations. It was oh, nice. Thank you, thank you everybody. Nice. Yeah. And then let's say farewell to Don, and let's see you again, if not tonight, maybe tomorrow. I hope you will come back, OK? See you later. Bye-bye. Uh, okay, well, Bye-bye. Thank you. OK. Then that is presentation from Don. Um, I would like to call maybe the next presenters to get prepared. Is from Cambodia, from the organization called Cooperation Committee for Cambodia or CCC. And then the one who will be presenting is <clears throat> Mr. Savannah Ree. So if you're ready, Mr. Savannah Ree, uh, I will offer uh, the screen to you. Thank you. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Isha. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Greeting for peace uh, from Cambodia. Uh, first of all, I have a great honor to join the online uh, Kathmandu Democracy Forum and to present the monitoring report. And thanks to college who worked so hard to make this even possible. Well, uh, for the case of Cambodia, COVID-19 pandemic did cause major impacts on livelihood hair and human rights of Cambodian people. Of course, Cambodia government remains, I mean, Cambodia remain in the stage of the, uh, Cambodia remain in state one of the outbreak. Uh, we do not have complete lockdown or compulsory stay home order. And the government established the national committee to combat the COVID-19, which led by the prime ministers to design the national policy and strategy to prevent COVID-19 pandemics. Of course, even Cambodia is still in state one, but it impacts massively on the stability of the economic and the society at both at national and international level. Until now, we have uh, 292 positive cases with a uh, highly recovery rate, almost uh, 66%, and there is no dead report. And it is important that we need to know that Cambodia has been praised by World Health Organization in terms of uh, responding to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Cambodia government has been applying uh, uh, strict measures in three different uh, front. Uh, first, they impose uh, restrictions on international travelers to prevent imported cases into Cambodia. And secondly, the government take immediate action to prevent local transmission within uh, Cambodia. Last but not least is to treat COVID-19 infected patients effectively. So the national 
a commission to combat the COVID-19 uh, pandemic play an important role to implement those uh, strict measures in order to ensure that Cambodia is not really, is not really impacted by the pandemic. Uh, you know, in Cambodia, we do not have widespread community transmission. More than 70% of Cambodia uh, total confirmed case were transported overseas. And the rest remains the links to those imported cases. But uh, Cambodia uh, government tried their best to strengthen public health measures, especially at the airport. And they advise international travelers to understand about the health information and put requirement, for example, uh, certificate and insurance. So those are important to make sure that those who are traveling to Cambodia are free of COVID-19. Uh, informal workers, government workers, and vulnerable group are the most impacted from the COVID-19. Uh, according to the statistic from the Ministry of uh, Labor and Vocational Training, approximately 500,000 uh, construction workers, street vendors, and entertainment workers lose their job and income. And most of them have no access to uh, social security funds. And they also live with a lot of debt with banks and uh, microfinance as well. And up to 700 thousand uh, garment worker were at risk of job loss. And approximately 70% were women. And women becomes the most vulnerable groups of the massive job loss during the COVID pandemic in Cambodia. And according to the statistic from the IMF, uh, Cambodia economic uh, progress downgrade to minus 4%. And this is a big loss uh, for the uh, country because uh, Cambodia enjoy uh, annually 7% of economic growth for almost a decade. And we observed that the poverty rate increased to higher level and the government uh, also uh, cut uh, the national expense to save uh, roughly 400 million US dollars of the national budget for coping with the COVID-19. Even the fact that uh, Cambodia government have uh, positive progress on the uh, COVID-19 response, but in terms of uh, civic space and democracy, there are some major impact that we need to address, especially from a civil society organization. First of all, we observe that uh, Cambodia government apply uh, strict uh, regulation or incorrect restriction environments and curtail the freedoms of expression for Cambodia citizen and arrested and call for education has been reported, especially amongst the medias and uh, journalists. In case uh, you uh, spread out uh, fake news, this is what the government call, uh, the government will take action and the government warn the journalists of uh, legal actions on the spread of misinformation. And we have the report, uh, approximately 47 uh, people has been engaged on this. Secondly, is the law on association and non-governmental organization. Legal framework has been, uh, has caused another challenges on uh, civic space and democratic development in Cambodia, especially during the uh, COVID-19 pandemics. By strictly implementing the Lango, it holds direct, impl hold direct implications on the ability of uh, CSO to act in advocating for human rights and to promote uh, transparency and accountability uh, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemics. 
Of course, uh, civil society organizations play an important role to strengthen democracy and civic space, even uh, the durations of the COVID-19 pandemic. And the national uh, the legislations also promulgated the law on the management of the nation in the state of emergency, or we call emergency law. In fact, uh, Cambodia did not declare the nation in the state of emergency, but the government uh, draft the law and the law has been uh, 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 adopted by the uh, legislation. So it is very, very uh, strict in terms of applying to prevent uh, or to take action during the pandemic like this. And the law used a broad term with unclear interpretation, which uh, paved way to the government to curtail uh, uh, freedoms of expressions and uh, press uh, uh, freedom. So that is why civil society organization try to advocate uh, the government and to clarify those uh, broad term for specific interpretation to ensure that the law will not uh, give so much uh, powers to the government to take action to monitor or to civilians by all means uh, to uh, amongst the Cambodian uh, people. So uh, with it broad language, it can uh, potentially use by the government to uh, to suppress the freedom or the fundamental rights, such as uh, privacy, uh, peaceful assembly after the pandemic. So this is what we concern the most, that the law will be used in different directions after the pandemic. So this is the summary of the uh, impacts of the COVID-19 on life and uh, human rights in Cambodia. As I just mentioned, informal workers garment workers and other vulnerable group becomes the most vulnerable um, people during the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And most of those people do not uh, get access to uh, social security funds. But at the same time, the government try to uh, provide some social support as well. For example, they provide ID, ID poor identification uh, to give uh, financial support uh, to those families. And uh, the assessments on the government response to COVID-19 in terms of uh, democratic uh, governance and uh, civic participation. So I address on four issues. One is about the uh, participation. We observe that the government's lack of uh, uh, establishments of meaningful, meaningful engagements and participation, especially among the most uh, impactful uh, the, especially among the most vulnerable uh, affected group like uh, Muslim people, uh, LGBTIQ and indigenous people, they are left behind uh, by, uh, in terms of uh, engaging with the uh, government's measures res uh, responding to the COVID-19. So the government have to improve uh, working approach in order to engage uh, all stakeholders like uh, civil society organization, private sectors, in consultation process, decision making process, and to be and to to build a resilient uh, preparedness uh, for uh, for those uh, stakeholders. And on the accountability aspects, uh, we still have the questions on the budgeting accountability of the governments. Uh, civil society organization uh, advocate for open government procurement process and expenditure. Of course, uh, these are very important and most of the people do not know or well, or do not receive uh, a clear information or those information are not well informed to the public. And we also uh, evaluate on the uh, perceptions of non-discrimination. Uh, we, uh, uh, we advocate for uh, zero tolerance on discrimination in providing a fund relief. As I just mentioned to you, Cambodia government provide financial support uh, to the people 
So we want them to apply equally without discrimination to the people, uh, especially those who have different uh, political tendencies uh, in Cambodia. And we also assess on the empowerment uh, uh, as well in terms of good governance. Uh, we observed that uh, a lack of need to access to information and engage in the uh, opportunities. We see gap of information, especially those who live in rural areas that could not access to Facebook, social media, so on and so forth. Yeah, of course, information are very important to educate people to be well prepared of the uh, pandemic. But uh, of course, at the national level or in the city, those people receive the information. But in a rural area or remote area, this is still the challenge. And the assessments on civil society organization response to challenges of the COVID-19. Of course, a civil society organization is a crucial actors in monitoring and the implementation of SDG 16. As I just mentioned to you, uh, even the fact that uh, Cambodia is a successful case in terms of combating the COVID-19 pandemics, but in terms of uh, SDG 16, uh, freedoms of association, freedoms of um, expression, still the problem. So that's why CSO have role to play to ensure that the governments fulfill the obligation as estranged in SDG 16 especially to promote uh, democ democratic and civic space. And we are very active in holding policymakers to accountable for their commitment, uh, especially in terms of uh, meaningful participation, uh, accountability, non-discrimination and empowerment uh, to ensure the human rights uh, standard will be uh, implemented in uh, Cambodia. Of course, uh, civil society organization uh -huh. play an important role interject. on SDG3. You have to make this to go. Okay. I'm sorry to interject, you have to make this to go. Yeah. Uh, CSO engage uh, very closely on SDG3, SDG4, SDG2, SDG8, 10, uh, 5, uh, 12, 13, 14, and 15. And this is the proposal from uh, uh, from uh, civil society organization uh, for positive change in uh, uh, in Cambodia uh, in terms of uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, combating. Uh, civil society organization play an important role uh, reflecting the uh, implementation and the achievement as well as the challenges of the SDG implementation, especially uh, the feedbacks and uh, VNR process, we want to strengthen the means of the implementation to promote a partnership for a sustainable development. And we also want to engage a UN agency in Cambodia to, uh, to promote a CSO a roadmap on SDG implementation from uh, 2021 to uh, 2030. Because right now, uh, Cambodia governments do not have action plans to implement uh, those uh, SDGs goal effectively, especially on SDG 16, and and we want uh, civil I mean civil society organization advocate the governments to establish an uh, independent uh, national uh, human rights institution, especially to implement uh, UPR recommendation and to monitor closely on the implementation of SDG uh, as recommended by governments and relevant body, and. Of course, on SDG 16, uh, we uh, civil society organization want the government to ensure that uh, Cambodia SDG, especially on SDG 16, align with uh, the global SDG to promote a peaceful and inclusive society for all, especially to get access to justice and to build an effective uh, institution at all level. And uh, we believe that leave no one behind is a key principle to engage or to build solidarities amongst uh, multi uh, stakeholders especially in terms of uh, dialogues and uh, international monitoring uh, it changes good in good uh, practice and effective response on uh, COVID-19 in the international framework such as uh, 
UPR and uh, other human rights uh, mechanism. Uh, we believe that youth is not just the uh, beneficiary of the SDG processes, but they are the potential actors to transform our world to uh, sustainable uh, development. So leave no one behind should uh, actively engage youth in the process as well. And uh, Kathmandu Democracy Forum should uh, consider youth as the driving force to realize this uh, global agenda. And uh, Kathmandu Democracy Forum provide a crucial platform to allow for CSO in Asia uh, to find common solution uh, to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, us participants should uh, follow the monitoring and evaluation of the SDG implementation in their uh, perspective country. So I would like to uh, and my presentation with this slide, I think it is very important uh, uh, can, can to find. Within 30, 30 seconds, because you pass almost 17 minutes now. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much. So, uh, so as I just mentioned, uh, strengthening the means of implementation and to realize a partnership for the sustainable development is very important uh, in terms of uh, working together internationally, regionally, and globally to fight the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic more effectively. And uh, thank you so much. And if you have any question, we welcome. All right. Thank you, uh, Ri, for your presentation. I think it's very much com comprehensive. So we, we observed the first two countries' presentation is presenting very low case of casual, uh, I mean, it's like a dead rate, Thailand and up with 59 up to, uh, until August, Cambodia uh, until now, surprisingly, no dead casualties because of the pandemics. It was surprising. So next, I would like to invite Indonesia. I think Indonesia will giving different perspective because Indonesia was, I don't know how many uh, like a dead rates right now because of the corona or uh, people who accused to be corona or change the status to be dead because of the corona. Uh, there will be uh, two presenters from two organizations. First is from Lokataru Foundation, Ms. Tatat, and from, uh, sorry, uh, Ms. Kirana Anjani, and then from International NGO Forum on Indonesia or INFIT, there is also Ms. Tatat. I don't know who going to make first presentation, but I, I guess the deal is you have to split the allocated times uh, uh, to fit all two presentations. So without further ado, I presenting who? Ms. Tatat first or Kirana? Uh, yes. Anyway, any, any of you. Over to you, Kirana. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Tatat will start the presentation first. Is my screen showing my presentation? Okay, over to you, Ms. Tatat. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Mas Ichal, and also thank you for all the uh, supported organizations and also other organizations involved for the online Kathmandu Democracy Forum. My name is Tatat from International NGO Forum on Indonesian Development or INFID. We will present uh, the Indonesia, Indonesian case together with Lokataro Foundation, uh, Kirana. So I will start now uh, the impacts of COVID-19 on SDG 16 and human rights in Indonesia. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, as uh, to answer uh, the question from my Ichal, this is uh, how the chronology data trends of COVID-19 in Indonesia, which is uh, the first confirmed case was in 2nd of March. And then on the 11th of March is the first day of case. And 31st of March, uh, the government declared public health emergency status. Meanwhile, in 7th of April, is the first large scale social restrictions or we called it a uh, partial lockdown uh, in Indonesia. Meanwhile, on 13th of April, the government declared the national disaster status and 14th of April is the first announcement of number of COVID-19 suspects. On the 27th of May, is the new normal protocol imposed by the government uh, and on the 6th uh, of June is the COVID-19 task force issued criteria and requirement for traveling during new normal times. So this is the additional cases uh, right now until the 
uh, 1st of November, which is the daily cases is among 3,500 up to 4,500 new cases. Uh, meanwhile, for the dead cases, uh, it's now maybe uh, move to the next uh, slide, please, Kirana. Uh, next slide, yeah. Sorry, my charger, I have to go first. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so now uh, the total number of cases is 415,402 uh, number and it with the positivity rate reached 13% uh, and then for the total number of deaths is 14,044 with the country fatality rate is 3.38%. Uh, so this is the, the, the number of people tested. So actually, uh, uh, Indonesia is still in the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic until now. And then for the major impact of COVID-19 on people's life, health and livelihood, as well as the human rights in Indonesia, actually we have more uh, impacts on SDGs and human rights, but due to the limited time for the, the presentation, we just limited to some of the uh, uh, rights, like, like the human, uh, right to health and then also gender equality, right to work, and SDGs as well as on the civic space. Uh, next, please. Yes, uh, for the right to health uh, itself, so Indonesia ranked among the least prepared in ASEAN in terms of public health capacities, uh, which is related to the ICU and number of hospital beds, and then the number of nurses and doctors. And then uh, the second one is the Indonesia score in contact tracing uh, only one. The score is only one, meaning li very limited tracing for the COVID-19. Meanwhile, other Southeast Asian countries such as Thailand and then also Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, Singapore, Malaysia scored uh, two for the contact tracing. So it, it means that it's very limited tracing. Uh, that's why uh, the, the number is also very high, the, the number of total cases. And then for the, uh, the impact of COVID-19, COVID-19 has disrupted 83.9% immunizations or vaccination for children and babies in Indonesia. And then also that COVID-19 hindered tuberculosis and other chronic illnesses treatments and access to sexual and reproductive health facilities. This is mainly because the closure of the integrated service post or posyandu in Indonesia due to the pandemic uh, COVID-19. Usually this posyandu is uh, this, the, the nearest uh, health services facilities in the neighborhood, but it, uh, yeah, it forced to be closed during the pandemic. And then uh, the gender, uh, the impact of COVID-19 on gender equality uh, here is that the COVID-19 quarantine increases the risk of violence against women in the household, where uh, according to Minister of Women Empowerment and Child Protection, uh, in, in July 2020, uh, the data shows that there has been a 75% increase in cases of violence against women since the COVID-19 pandemic starts in March. And then also that uh, the COVID-19 increasing uh, increased the number of child marriage, where according to the Minister of Women Empowerment and Child Protections, uh, uh, the number of child marriage increased by 24,000 during the pandemic. So uh, this, this increasing number partly because many parents consider that marrying their children can solve their economic hardships during the pandemic. And then uh, the impact, other impact of COVID-19 on gender is that uh, it increased uh, women's time doing unpaid and domestic care work, uh, especially when uh, uh, the women work at home and then they should also take care of the uh, families, the children doing uh, uh, school from home as well as the domestic work and uh, the, the work from the office. And then also that uh, COVID-19 affects the fulfillment of rights and access to sexual and reproductive services for women, for example, for the women who wants to uh, access to uh, contraceptive, uh, uh, contraceptive access and then also uh, services for uh, pregnant women and so on. And the last one is that the uh, COVID-19 has exacerbated the rights of women in general related to gender equality. Uh, for example, by uh, in July, the House of Representatives excluded draft bill on sexual violence for the eradication of sexual violence from the national legislation priority program because uh, the House of Representatives considered that this law is not uh, urgent during the pandemic. So, and then uh, next, please. Yeah, and then the uh, impact of COVID-19 on right to work and SDG 10 as well as the 
SDG 8, uh, that by early September 2020, 3.5 million people lost their jobs. And then also that the Minister of Finance uh, predicts the number of poor people will increase by 3.2 million by the end of 2020. And then also that there's the likelihood of Indonesians falling from poor to very poor uh, by 55%. And the probability of the vulnerable groups falling to the poor by 47%. So this condition set back the achievement target of uh, SDG 10.1, which is to progressively achieving and maintaining income growth of people who are below 40% of the population. And uh, other impacts is on the vulnerable groups, which is here uh, we listed the ethnic minorities, all the persons, children, people with disability and the social minorities. I will just uh, mention in brief that for example, the study revealed that indigenous peoples who inhabit 90 uh, areas directly bordering oil palm plantations face the threat of starvation during the COVID-19. And then uh, uh, COVID-19 also increasing number of violence against children and also deprive children from it, uh, their rights to education. Uh, yeah, and then next presentation will be continued by Kirana, please. Okay, thank you, Matapat. Uh, Masih Chow? If I may know how many times do I have left for Indonesia? So I, I can. It's around yeah. six, seven. You have another eight minutes. Oh, okay, okay, sure. Um, thank you, Pasi Chow. Thank you, Asia Democracy Network, for conducting this very anticipated democracy forum. My name is Kirana Anjani. I'm an assistant researcher at Lokatar Foundation, where I focus on civil and political rights particularly the fundamental rights of civic freedoms, which are uh, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, and freedom of association. Now, before I begin my presentation, I'd like to say that this findings is just a small fraction of what is actually happening in Indonesia. Civil society here is witnessing an unprecedented decline of democracy and COVID-19 has definitely accelerated the existing shrinking civic space. We have a tax on every fundamental rights from state to non-state actors. We have, as you can see, digital attacks to human rights defenders. We have pulse, um, national police intensify and cyber monitor. We have issues on transparency of um, laws that are passed by the government and so on. Now, what is the ma major impact of COVID-19 to civic space and democracy actually? Government is essentially creating and imposing measures to shrink civic, civic space and hinder civil society's work on the pretext of COVID-19 handling. For example, in responding to COVID-19 um, misinformation, misinformation and hoax, instead of giving more reliable and authoritative information, the government is policing and criminalizing uh, vague concepts such as fake news, hoaxes, using the uh, IT law. And the National Police also issued a telegram to instruct the police for robust cyber patrol that is uh, monitoring the activities of civil society, the opinions of civil society regarding the government and government, uh, particularly the government pandemic handling. But this uh, particular telegram also instructed uh, police to also monitor people who are um, allegedly insulting the president or public officials. Now this telegram is used for a, a lot of um, instances in, uh, criti um, in criminalizing government critics, uh, public official critics, and uh, during the COVID-19 handling. Also we have cyber attacks against activists and media uh, including hacking and doxing. We have the curious case of Rafio Patra, where uh, Rafio Patra, uh, during the onset of the pandemic, he was a very um, active government critic, criticizing um, fun, um, government uh, measures in handling pandemic. And his WhatsApp account was hacked and was used by the hacker to uh, spread uh, messages which um, allegedly insulting people to create chaos and riot. While the police has um, rejected Rafael Patra's lawsuit, they are not, they, there has not uh, any um, progress in uh, the hacking investigation by the police. 
And also Mera Johan Shah, um, he is a director of the JATAM, the um, National Network on uh, Against Mining. Um, his WhatsApp account is also allegedly, oh no, uh, the, uh, his, he experiences doxing on Twitter after he criticizes the government, uh, specifically Jokowi regarding the, the event um, during the pandemic. Uh, meanwhile, Tempo and Tirto uh, is two medias which experienced uh, hacking as well after they reported and published the involvement of national state intelligence in creating uh, vaccines. Um, there has been also a report of re uh, police using excessive force and forced criminalization to impose a large scale social restriction and other restrictive measures. This one led to casualty in Papua where the police used a uh, water cannon to disperse people. They are um, allegedly crowding and the water cannon uh, affected one person and led to casualty. Also, we have unnecessary hindrance to a civil society's work. Police has been monitoring um, civil society's work, even if it's um, related to initiatives to help the poor during the pandemic. For example, Jogja Food Solidarity Community Kitchen is surveillance and distribution of food to low-income informal workers. They were the their kitchen was visited by not, um, by allegedly a an intelligence and who asked for the absence list and took pictures of the members of the food solidarity community. Also, we have meetings of CSOs that are forcefully disbanded by police due to public concern. We have also the case about environmental activists being falsely claimed to be tested positive for COVID-19. So there are three um, activists in Walhi in East Kalimantan, which are visited which were visited by um, Samarinda public health officials. They were asked to take the uh, COVID-19 test for random sampling. And because of that, um, they were falsely claimed to be tested positive. The public health officials could not provide the printed or the exact evidence that they have um, tested positive for COVID but then they were evicted and were forcefully taken to the hospital. And subsequently, the three activists uh, took the COVID-19 test and were tested negative. Also, we have a possible enforced disappearance case using COVID-19 test and quarantine in Intan Jaya, Papua, where two persons were taken by the police to be tested for COVID and conducted quarantine afterwards for two weeks, but it has been reported that they have not come back yet until now from April 2020. Um, now, okay. Can you wrap up within one minute, please? Okay, okay, okay. so sorry. Um, assessment of government response to COVID-19 in terms of democratic governance and civic participation. Um, on the onset of the uh, pandemic, government has been criticized for um, undermining the threat of the COVID-19 with our Minister of Health publicly challenged the School of Public Health from Harvard researchers who are questioning the COVID-19 in Indonesia. They respond, the government respond to pandemic by enacting law number two in 2020 on COVID-19 pandemic response, which removes accountability principle altogether. This, um, uh, for example, the cost incurred in this law uh, in the, uh, during the pandemic is not considered a state loss and public officials cannot be prosecuted both under criminal and civil, civil law. And the um, decisions during the COVID-19 cannot be uh, brought to um, state administrative court, which means it, it practically closes any opportunity for the, govern for the civil society to ask for um, government accountability. Furthermore, um, they undermine rule of law. The, there has been a use of excessive force, as I've mentioned, there was a lack of transparency on COVID-19 data, number of tests, and with the president admitted to deliberately holding back data. And this is also the effect of the, I'm sorry, the effect of the assessment of the government. They are passing uh, rather undemocratic and controversial laws, as has been mentioned by, sorry, by Matatat before. 
um, they are styling sexual violence bill, but passing uh, omnibus law, uh, revision of mining laws, and so on. And these are our recommendation to the government. They are on the public sector and civic space and democracy. We are recommending that restrictions on rights should follow recognized principles. And while measures on pandemic handling can um, possibly restrict a freedom of movement and assembly, they should not um, disproportionately uh, restrict other rights such as freedom of expression. And these are the assessment of CSL's response, which I think Matata can have an insight on this. Um, yeah, I will try to be quick. The uh, assessment of CSO's response and recommendations, uh, uh, you can also read that, and I will just mention three points of this. The first one is that at the onset of the pandemic, CSOs were overwhelmed with adapting the programs to the new restrictions, such as moving from offline to online activities, and then also uh, adapting and find new ways of advocacy and the like with the existing trajectory human rights violation will continue just actively defending and not taking for granted the existing continually shrinking civic space is very important. And the last one is the campaign to promote citizen participation, transparency and accountability in handling COVID-19 pandemic in Indonesia. This is uh, what we are uh, working on right now, uh, both for the CSOs working on the uh, ecosoc rights as well as uh, for the civil the civic and political rights and next uh, last slide please yeah this is the uh, recommendations uh, how cso's in asia can work together internationally regionally and globally I will, I will just you can also read uh, in the slide i will just mention some of them uh, we, uh, the, it is very important uh, to uh, provide capacity building for cso's on facing digital threats they may hinder civic space this, because this is uh, happened not only in Indonesia. And then second one is just the joint campaign on the importance of gender mainstreaming and COVID-19 handling. And uh, also to increase the substantial collaborations on human rights, especially regional cross campaign, criticizing the repressive measure of COVID-19 in neighboring countries. And the last one is the joint urgent calls for governments to protect civil society and human rights defenders work. So thank you, uh, that's uh, uh, from Indonesia, uh, yeah. From India yeah. and uh, uh, Lokataru. Okay. Thank you, Miss Tatat and Miss Kirana and Jenny. Unfortunately, time is is not <laughs> it's, it's, it's very tight. I this is this is a thing a very nice combination of two focus human rights uh, from the organization human rights perspective and also development perspective. I was there for almost eight months and quite uh, watching all this unfolded, uh, but. Uh, let's hear uh, from another countries within the Southeast Asia who has a very deep impact on the uh, on the pandemics of COVID-19. Can I call a uh, presenter from the Philippines, uh, Philippines Alliance of Human Rights Advocates or PAHRA, Mr. Renato Liori? Yes, good afternoon. Afternoon, well, if you're yesterday. ready, then I offer to you. Yeah, I think uh, you see my presentation. I've just flashed it right now. Yes, yes. So this is the presentation monitoring report of the Philippines by the Philippine Alliance of Human Rights Advocates. And thank you very much to the Community of Democracies and the Asian Democracy Network for this opportunity. Um, first, we'd like to just give you, it's not moving give you an overview of uh, COVID-19 here in the Philippines. Okay, here it is. Okay. So yes, we, we are second to Indonesia, both in number of cases and in deaths. Right now, we, as of November 2, we have 385,000. But active cases, according to the Department of Health, is around 7.9%, okay, or 29,000. Most are males, and right now the bulk of the active cases or the cases that have been tallied comes from the 20 to 39 years of age. So these are the working ages, okay? But mortality is high among the elderly, around 40%. Well, testing actually at first was very slow, but it picked up sometime around the middle of the year. And also at this time, government has uh, been able to uh, ramp up isolation centers, okay? and but at this time, cases already had increased. Okay? Uh, the start, contact tracing was very poor, and it was one of the 
recommendation sa actually to improve on. No? This was according to the contract tracing lead, no? a mayor from a uh, city in the north. And also PPEs at the very beginning of the pandemic was really inadequate. That's why we saw actually a lot of uh, uh, cases from the, from the medical uh, professionals. But recently, in recent weeks actually, uh, what we found uh, due also to some independent no, uh, experts who are also monitoring the pandemic here, uh, there's a downtrend in number of cases. The positivity rate has gone down to 6% and 92.1% uh, are actually mild and asymptomatic. But uh, also we, we note here that around 3,500 per million actually uh, is the, the number of cases. 66 also are deaths per million here in the Philippines. Most of the data I'm presenting here is from the Department of Health okay, or the Health Ministry here in the Philippines. Now, what is the impact of the COVID-19? No? Not particularly COVID-19 itself, but the lockdowns, which is the response of government. And when we say here in the Philippines lockdown by March, uh, after declaring a state of calamity, everything was closed, okay? uh, except for the essentials, no? the, uh, hospitals, uh, drug stores, groceries and markets. Uh, everything else was closed. Malls were closed, no gatherings, everything. So health protocols were all, all in, in force. Okay? So what happened then? Okay? So the, the first concern when we look at it, by the way, this is also uh, just a brief you know, uh, rundown of certain human rights affected and SDGs also, uh, goals also that are affected, including later when we talk of civic space and democracy, SDG 16. So what were the concerns? First, mental health, okay? particularly the elderly and the children. Uh, a study here of one of the NGOs saw that 54% of children express negative emotions. You know, they're sad, they're, they, they're, they're, they're scared, they're worried. And then women also have reported according to, uh, I think this is the Philippine Commission on Women, that well, they have this mental and emo emotional health you know, really deteriorating. So mental health is a concern aside from, of course, uh, access to services in hospitals wherein it was now getting swamped by cases of COVID-19 and to, to be able to attend to other uh, diseases and uh, uh, healthcare services. Another thing is on education. Education, uh, it stopped actually uh, before the school year last year or uh, the 2019-2020 stopped before it ended. And then the school year this year began only on October 5, usually it begins in June. And only 80% from those enrolled last year were able to come back to school. And using no face-to-face -face activities, only using blended learning. So some poor families had problems with having gadgets and everything. Okay? Around 400 private schools have actually stopped or closed for this year, they declared it. Now, a very worrying part here is that a recent survey just this September saw that the involuntary hunger okay, or hunger with people not having anything to eat, at least in the last three months, uh, uh, once in the last three months, rose to 30.7% or a third of the population. Okay? And what did we find out? Uh, the National Food Coalition said, well, this is not about anything else, but it's because of the unemployment rate or the, 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 the cases of unemployment and the employment. So un, un, unemployment rose to 17.7% just because of the lockdown. So 7.3 million had no jobs and 12 million had jobs, but they could not go to work. So all of these are contributing to that uh, uh, result in hunger. But worst things here would be the Department of Labor said, if you've used up your leave credits, no work, no pay. So no money, no food, okay? So this is what happens. And eventually a study also said, well, with this three month lockdown, if there's a three month lockdown, poverty incidence will increase, the poverty severity gap will increase, and the Gini coefficient will show really big income gaps, okay? Among sectors, there are concerns first about gender-based violence and violence against women and children. So recorded, no, just to be graphic about it, 804 incidents were actually recorded. The police have also recorded around 391 cases, 42 of those are rape cases, okay? So you can imagine lockdowns, uh, 
in, in cramped spaces, especially in urban areas. And another worrying thing here, because everybody was online, there's a 200% increase noted in terms of uh, child sex abuse forums, uh, online child sexual exploitation and uh, abuse. Okay? So this is something very worrying that has happened during the lockdowns. Also, the Philippines has a very big population of overseas Filipino workers. And because of this, this uh, COVID-19, more than 300,000 um, is expected to be uh, repatriated. But as of the, the report, there are already 28,000 who have been uh, sent home. We're also looking at uh, reports at, uh, by the National Federation of uh, Tribal uh, Groups about food relief not reaching them and having difficulties of going to their farms, uh, considering that uh, they, 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 they are really you know, uh, one of the poorest sectors here. Okay? We also found, uh, as reported, that some LGBTs have been actually humiliated okay? because they said they violated the, the restrictions of the quarantines. But then again, why would you let them uh, kiss, dance, and do push-ups on live video? And another 20 had also been actually apprehended, arrested, because they were actually uh, protesting the new anti-terrorism bill, which I will be talking about a little bit more later. So another thing in environment, well, tons and tons of infectious healthcare waste has been recorded. Okay? This is from April to July, so during the time of the quarantine. So these are environmental concerns. So, here we see all the other SDGs that have been affected and the sectors have been affected. Now, what is the impact of the COVID-19 lockdowns on civic space and democracy and, and the policies, of course? Well, with limited movement and limited access to you know, information, okay, there's a further shrinking of civic space, particularly among CSOs, among human rights defenders, among, with PARA in terms of uh, moving around. This started since March. Okay? And PARA has already received you know, reports, I'll, I'll show you the data later, about the uh, violations of human rights. Okay? Now, how do, you, how do you look at this, these quarantines? Okay? Um, you can imagine living here and then you hear from the radio that, okay, you must follow this, although this is being downplayed frequently, but there's a shoot to kill order. Okay? You must follow this or else. And then we hear from the news, a mentally challenged man, of course, uh, who may not be you know, uh, in his right mind not following the, 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 the quarantine regulations was shot. Okay? 21 protesters, they were just lining up for food. Well, they were arrested. Okay? The, the PNP, which is the Philippine National Police, actually records 156,000 okay, violators of the quarantines and 15 were killed. Uh, there were also reports, actually this also came to, to para some of it, okay? And, and you can see in the picture, in one barangay, a group of teenagers were placed inside a dog cage. Maybe this is quite an exaggeration and nitpicking, but this is how they interpret the law. This is how they interpret the, the quarantines. Okay. So when we look at it, uh, the quarantines actually also affected the participation of people in, in actually combating the COVID-19 pandemic. People were inside their homes and then it was a handful of people only you know, uh, deciding on what to do and what not to do. Okay? So at, at some point, the elderly were up in arms because they said not all of us are, uh, have comorbidities. Some of us are healthy. Some of us are working. 60 years old, they're still working. Okay? So they raised their voice. Medical professionals also clamored for, wait, let's have a break. Okay? So, so these are things that uh, are happening. So. There's, there's quite an a, a imbalance in terms of part, participation. And there's also some, some level of marginalization that has happened because of the quarantines. But something very worrying is that during the, the pandemic, the lockdowns, they passed the anti-terror law. It's different this time. The anti-terror law is something that, well, if you look at it in the report, okay, uh, it has a very, very strong uh, potential of really uh, suppressing Okay. civic space, democracy, justice even, okay. just they even, even prescribe uh, without any uh, proceedings, without any procedure, that you are a terrorist. Okay. So this can affect so many things. Okay. And right now there are still killings, particularly there are concerns now of 
uh, the killings that are happening with uh, some organizations that belong to the uh, left, the progressive uh, left. And there's continuous red tagging, harassment, and even members of PARA who are doing their work as human rights defenders have actually been tagged in a Facebook account. Okay? So this is what's happening. So the assessment here is so more than anything else, the response is more of a military approach. Okay? Lockdowns coupled with, well, these are kill policies or kill directives, okay? And uh, uh, really uh, installing, well, mostly ex-military officers in the command versus COVID-19, although the DOH, they say it's on top of it every day, but most of them are really uh, uh, former generals. So when you look at it, what, what happened there would be, okay, uh, there were reports actually, so this is only to para, 16, 67 incidents affecting 180 victims. What are these cases? Inhuman and degrading treatment, punishment, arbitrary arrest, detention, violent dispersal, and extrajudicial killings, okay? So these are things that happen. Now, the Bayanihan law also cracks down on freedom of speech. It's something similar like, like what Indonesia actually reported. And it's there that, well, you should not do fake news, but fake news is, isn't really fake news. Sometimes when you are just voicing out what you are concerned about in terms of the quarantines. But even before this happened, there had already been policies by the Securities and Exchange Commission to disclose, so, uh, where, where do you get your funding? The DIG says, okay, what are your activities, okay? But all of these are meant actually to suppress CSO and all of these were in effect during the quarantine time, okay? But the second part of it is, I said it's the military part, okay? And then the, the second part is, well, it's also a doll out type of lockdown, okay? Everything went to a halt. The economy went to a halt. You know, that's why we reported 30.7 hungry, et cetera, okay? So many poor and the poorest Filipinos were perilously out of work and needing doll outs. So they had the Bainihan Act. Well, of course, maybe, yes, it helped. Those were the poorest of the poor. Yeah? But eventually, you know, uh, there are concerns about the funds, how it's, it was used. And even the Presidential Anti-Corruption Commission has reported that, well, there have been already 3,992 complaints. Okay? So imagine giving out 5,000 to 8,000 per family to around 23 million Filipinos, okay? uh, families. Okay? And at the time of the height of the pandemic, you hear about corruption in the field health of the National Health Insurance System. That if this continues, maybe by, uh, I think, next year or two years from now, this, yeah, this thing will start. If yes? you can try to start to wrap, wrap up, I think you have one minute now. <laughs> yeah, okay. okay. So the assessment is, well, PARA adopted the lockdown, continued human rights defense and, uh, and uh, protection doing a lot of things online and policy advocacy continues, especially against the death penalty, death penalty and uh, the other you know, death bills. But another thing is the mounting, of course, on the anti-terrorism act, okay? So severely limited CSO response, CSOs, NGOs, PARA remain vulnerable, but work has continued online and PARA continues to adapt network and be vigilant. So this is basically PARA. Now the proposal to government is very simple, okay? This is a health crisis, stop the dole out in military approach, focus more on the health part, but you know, respecting the rights of everyone. And also having funds and prepare for vaccinations, particularly of the poor who may not be able to afford it. So working towards the SDGs and also the new one, the Human Rights Council resolution on technical cooperation. Uh, maybe this is something to be taken seriously. For Congress, reject the death penalty reimposition and to local governments, mainstream human rights based approach to government and democracy. And the Commission on Human Rights, let's work together uh, better and, and, and more expansively. Okay? And another thing, just maybe two minutes, okay, to international organizations, we need to work together for the SDGs. We need to have a better program in terms of helping the Philippines in its uh, human uh, technical cooperation uh, program. Uh, this is a result of the, the cases on the war on drugs. And also uh, maybe focus on a recovery plan uh, uh, for ASEAN, uh, particularly among CSOs, and also move forward in terms of a rights-based approach to governance and development. And, and I think uh, these are things. Uh, PARA proposed a declaration, a 19-point declaration 
uh, action points. And these are things that we need to work on here in the country and also to work beyond even the COVID-19 against the anti-terror law and also moving towards the human rights-based approach as I mentioned earlier. Okay. And finally, uh, recommending, of course, for how we can work together. I think K the KMDF will generate a manifesto, but the important thing there is to get to the learning. And as I've said earlier, when we were being consulted, a recovery and resiliency plan for CSOs, because disruptions like COVID-19 and COVID-19 lockdowns will always happen. Okay? And of course, other things, security, and again, helping each other in human rights-based approach to governance and democracy. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Renato, for a very wonderful presentations and then PowerPoint. I guess I understand you have a lot of to say within your presentation. Unfortunately, time is not uh, very uh, friendly enough. So yeah, that's that also to remind uh, the rest of the presenters, uh, please be wise to allocating uh, time for each your PowerPoint presentations. So at least you can display and explaining your presentations uh, to the audience. I think that is the ultimate goal that you have to do uh, and then to displaying what you do and including try to bring understanding to the audience as well. So uh, I would like to continue uh, with the Singapore report uh, from Think Centers. Then I welcome Mr. Ted Tans to proceed your presentations and then I offer to you. Okay, thank you, Icha. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. Yes. Okay, I'm um, starting the slideshow, okay. All right, uh, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, I'm, my name is Ted, uh, T-E-D. Uh, I'm presenting this report on behalf of Think Center. Uh, okay. So I'll just start immediately with the uh, impact of COVID-19 on the uh, people's lives, health and livelihood. Um, in terms of the uh, lives and health, uh, as of like end of last month, we have more than 58,000 cases and the majority of the cases are migrant workers. Uh, the Most of the cases were from between April to July and some parts of uh, August. And in terms of the local community transmission, it's slightly over 2,000 uh, in total and uh, slightly over 1,000 for imported cases. Uh, COVID-19 has been with us in Singapore uh, for about 10 months. Our first case was in uh, 23rd January. Uh, it was of a Chinese tourist. And uh, the cases have you know, uh, now it's quite low. We don't get that many in the community. Uh, in fact, we get more from imported cases as in people uh, coming back to Singapore, right? And so far, most of them have recovered and we are very lucky to only have uh, 28 fatalities. Uh, the last death was actually on 13 October. And before that, we have a break of no deaths for three months. Uh, the 27th death was on 15 July. So uh, we are quite lucky and uh, I can quite safely say it's thanks to the uh, high quality uh, health uh, services that we have here. And right, and the impact on the livelihood, right? Uh, according to our labor ministry, we call it the Ministry of Manpower here, uh, the latest estimates that we just released for September was that the unemployment rate for citizens is 4.9%. But if we include the permanent residents here, uh, it would decrease to 4.7%. So what it means actually there are a bit more of unemployed citizens than you know, including the PRs. Uh, okay, I need to do this. Okay. Yeah. Right. So the majority of the employment loss was during this period uh, of April to June. Uh, is, uh, incidentally, it's uh, during the circuit breaker. So we call our lockdown here in Singapore the circuit breaker. It was imposed uh, with effect from April 7 and lifted on June 2nd. So between these three months, uh, we lost more than 100,000 jobs. Uh, yeah. 
Okay, I'll go to the next one. And 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 the total, okay. All right. So in terms of the uh, impact on human rights and SDG, I made a table, right? Uh, although here I listed five SDG targets that are affected, but obviously there are more, but uh, I chose this because of their uh, cross-cutting uh, impact. Right, for, for the first one is uh, SDG 1.3, which is uh, basically about the social protection uh, for everyone in Singapore. So if uh look at this, our government's uh, voluntary national report on SDG they submitted in 2018. So they self-assess themselves that uh, they are you know, still in progress in implementing this goal. So obviously it's, everybody is affected. And during the uh, our lockdown period, uh, although I put here thousands, it's actually hundreds of thousands of people who, who applied for the uh, financial relief package from the government. Uh, many of them are self-employed or they, they work on a, like a freelance basis. And of course, many more also who were already in low-wage jobs were affected when uh, the workplaces were shut down. Right. The, Next one is the SDG 5.2, so elimination of violence against all women and girls. All right, uh, Singapore is still uh, well in progress. We are not perfect, at least uh, the government acknowledged that. And the uh, women in vulnerable situations are uh, affected. They are like the migrant domestic workers and the migrant spouses, and this group are of the. Uh, LBTQ plus women are uh, basically they are women who, who are not uh, identified as a heterosexual. All right. Uh, during the lockdown period, uh, many of the NGOs or the women's groups that they offered hotlines uh, reported an uh, increase in in the uh, calls made to their hotlines. So uh, this also includes um the migrant domestic workers who caught the uh, migrant workers organization specifically. And for the LBTQ plus women, they actually surveyed uh, their group. So they surveyed about 500 people and one in five of them reported that they face increased risk of violence, uh, whether is it physical or mental uh, in their home because they are all trapped in, uh, we're, we're all, you know, we can't really go out freely during that period. So the third SDG is the uh, 8.8, .8, which is the labor rights for all, including migrant workers. All right. Uh, th this is uh, something that uh, is linked to the SDG 1.3. But like in terms of the labor rights itself, it, uh, I would say the migrant workers and the essential workers are affected. Uh, by essential workers, we, uh, I mean those working uh, in the front line, uh, those in, working in the supermarkets, uh, those who have to keep the shops supplying the essential supplies uh, opening, operating during the, that period. So in, the impact on migrant workers is that uh, because they are the, most of them, we have about three, over 300 of them living in uh, purpose-built dormitories. So as in dormitories specifically built for uh, the purpose of housing uh, migrant workers who are working in, in uh, sectors like the shipyards and construction. So they suffered the most during this period. Uh, many of them have to be quarantined or isolated in the dormitories, whether is it the uh, where they were already staying or in the government uh, uh, facilities that they set up to you know, try to contain the uh, outbreak, right? And of course, because our forum is on SDG 16 plus, um, developing effective accountable institutions at all levels and uh, the ensuring a responsive and inclusive uh, decision-making at all levels. So, in fact, during the 2018 report, it was not measured or was, yeah, uh, although in the report itself did uh, write something about the Singapore institutions, but the government don't really uh, try to address this. 
Right, and of course, everyone asks here in Singapore whether we are migrant workers or, or citizens, we are affected because of this. Uh, some examples I can quote, like uh, PWDs here are persons with disabilities. Uh, they reported having difficulty to cope with the circuit breaker measures, which is basically the social distancing and uh, you know the restricted movement, and they can't really assess uh, information as fluently as like uh, others, because for example, the uh, persons who are blind, uh, they can't really read the all the information posters that have been uh, put up. Right, and of course they face uh, issue assessing decent work, right? And one of the measures that the government uh, did was they tried to set up a task force to focus on the economic recovery. Uh, but when we see the composition of those who make up of the this committee or task force, most of them were men, and yeah, there were like I think only two women out of the fifteen or seventeen members. So there was really criticism that uh, this doesn't have representation in terms of gender or race or even uh, in terms of the sectors they come from. Okay, so before COVID-19, what was Singapore like? Okay, uh, our democracy, yes, we have democracy because of elections, but uh, it's usually uh, assessed as flawed, uh, partly free, and our press freedom is quite bad. Yeah, pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a very serious situation. And I'd just like to uh, highlight this World Justice Project. Although it ranks Singapore pretty high because of uh, the high scores on order and security and things like anti corruption and the efficiency of, of the government uh, offices, uh, but it ranks relatively low on the constraint on government powers. And of course, our relative lack of fundamental rights, right? And in terms of the civic space that we face here in Singapore, of course, is uh, if you are familiar with us, it's actually quite restricted, and so civicus we take as obstructed, right? So, what the Singapore government likes to show the world, even before COVID, and even now, I think they want to show a beautiful picture, but uh, how we experience it is. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, we are known as a fine city. So why a fine city? Because there are many laws and regulations regulating our behavior. Right? So obviously that means the our existing uh, legal framework is very restrictive on particularly on rights to expression and assembly, uh, especially for political expression. Uh, so that's why during the pandemic, Singapore did not like specially pro proclaim a special emergency, uh, unlike many of the other countries. Uh, but what they have, they use the existing laws to uh, manage the situation. So one of it, obviously, is the Infectious Disease Act. But uh, under this act, uh, they also develop new regulations and uh laws as well so what are these these are the uh stay like the first one the stay orders it basically just, just justify the orders that the government issue for people who have to stay at home or to stay in quarantine right and for this uh number two the covid temporary measures act is actually uh it, it lists the uh financial relief it's like a relief package that uh they are they enforce for the businesses and generally everybody, like uh, rent reliefs and things like that. So things that the ones that impact on our you know everyday uh, freedom of movement is the temporary control order regulations. So it uh, this act will affect our individual freedom. It mandates us to wear masks when we go outside. It uh, mandates the social distancing regulations. It uh, closes down the uh, places of entertainment or non-essential places during the circuit breaker. And the next one is uh, parliamentary special arrangements. So because we have an election this year and before they can hold an election, uh, 
taking into account all the COVID measures, they have to come up with this law to justify any uh, changes made to our usual elections. And uh, this one, the COVID-19 uh, temporary measures for the foreign employee dormitories, uh, it justifies the uh, measures imposed in the dormitories uh, state, uh, where the 300 over 1,000 migrant workers are staying. And the last one is not uh, actually a law that came out this year, but it was just passed near the end of last year, but it has an impact on, on, uh, on us this year. So like in terms of the discussion on the internet and the online media freedom. Okay. All right. So sorry for this one. It's a bit wordy. So I just try to take everyone through this. So what we have, we have an election during this uh, pandemic year. So uh, I think most of us here would you know, be talking about this election for many years to come for various reasons. So in Singapore, elections play the role in shaping the perception we are a democracy. So, but there are only two public institutions that people directly uh, participate in the election. One is the parliament and the other one is the president. Uh, by right, the next election wasn't to due to be held by April next year, but nobody expected a uh, pandemic this year. But uh, even before uh, 2020, the great bind was that, that there will be likely an election this year, but we just don't know when. Uh, and in March, during March this year, the prime minister, he, he hinted heavily that, okay, we have two choices. Either we hold elections before when things stabilize, that means like our infections are controlled and numbers are not spiking and all to call elections early. Right. That was in March and before the explosion of the infections uh, happened in the dormitories. Okay. So in... in uh, uh, Ted, yes, try I'm to... trying to finish it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So uh, the objections to it. Yes. Oh, sorry. There are... There are objections to it. Sorry. Okay. But uh, anyway, to, to, to summarize the results of the elections, uh, we actually were worried that, they, that there will be a wipeout of opposition. But uh, luckily, the, the, the opposition won additional formal seats. So we don't have a, a totally dominate, a parliament dominated by one party. Right. And Right, the use of uh, POFMA, right? Uh, basically, it uh, was meant to combat against fake news and misinformation. And during the whole of this year, there were 35 orders made uh, in regards to COVID and 16 were made during the election, right? So this, this is just to give you an idea on how this uh, law has impact on our uh, democracy. Right. In terms of the our CSO's response, uh, well, the civil society in Singapore is not very big unless you include the charities and uh, other groups. But generally, I can say it's very active. We are, they, they were very active in responding to the issues. And they adapted quite well to the restrictions uh, through the use of internet, like what we are doing now, but there was no Zoom at that time. But uh, well, when Zoom get picked up, uh, everybody started using. And in fact, uh, it was beyond just the normal groups that were active. Uh, many individuals launched their own initiatives, right? So, so much so that the government actually set up a portal to uh, let people uh, you know, choose the kind of activities they want to support, right? So the uh, our responses can be categorized as two: one services, and the other one is advocacy, right? Uh, I don't really want to uh, read this thing, but uh, I'll just say between that for the services oriented, I mean like charity and humanitarian response. So. Uh, most of these were started by people who are not formally associated with any organized groups, but they came together and they have set up, they set up a platform, they set up their own coalition, and they've done many good things. Okay, 
right? And the other one is the like the just the advocacy. Uh, Think Center is a advocacy group, so we are one of the very few groups that focus on the monitoring of the uh, democracy and human rights during the pandemic. And uh, third one is actually a mix of both. So, so the this group they have to work particularly harder during the pandemic because they have to both monitor and they have to also step out on the services. So I can uh say they they are one of the hardest working groups. Okay, next. Okay, the proposals. All right. Uh, I I didn't have two slides for this. I just combined. Okay, but so. For the one on the left is to the our government, right? Uh, basically, I just highlight that uh, I would like them to adopt a people-centered approach uh, when addressing the issues that arise during the pandemic. Because uh, if you look at our budget measures, a majority, more than half of it is actually uh, targeted for businesses, right? So our social protection is still not institutionalized. It's still very ad hoc. Ad hoc. So it is dependent on uh, the government's uh, fiscal budgeting of, of those payments, right? And then the second one that, of course, is to please, please learn lesson from the pandemic and and uh, you know address the issue of migrant workers' rights, yeah, right? And to the regional and international organizations, which is addressing to all of us here, uh, maybe we should try to continue this network to engage in a people responsive way to the challenge of COVID-19 and also to prepare for future events, maybe like climate change, things like that, right? And this one is, right, to my own fellow Singapore groups, uh, of course, to continue yeah. monitoring the rights, right, and highlighting it to the public and government. And uh, I would really like them to you know, engage on a more horizontal level and uh, to discuss the impact and the, the measures in terms of the human rights and SDG. Right? And to the regional and international CSOs is to well, help us to amplify our concerns on the ground. Right? And, I, and I really think after going through all these exercises, uh, we, we do need to have an easy to use uh, SDG framework so that the other groups uh, can understand how how their actions can fit into you know uh, yeah. the framework, right? Okay, and finally, okay, finish last slide. The, <laughs> the, <laughs> all right, the takeaway, <laughs> yeah. So so after all, all, all that, I just want people to remember this, right? Uh, the takeaway is that in Singapore, our situation would not have been so bad if. The government had respected and protected the rights of migrant workers in terms of the living conditions and, and a, yeah, yeah. enabling them to you know uh, speak freely without any repercussion, right? So if all those were addressed like years before, we would not have faced the issue in April onwards, and then there will be no like great upheaval to people's life, or at least a lesser impact, right? So this is what I would like us to. Remember. <laughs> okay. Thank you very All much. Right. Thank, you. Thank you, Ted, uh, for the presentation. Again, time's not in our side. Sorry. So, sorry. <laughs> I think that's that is completing the Southeast Asia Prayer Centers. Then let's fly a little bit far uh, to the east. <laughs> east or not east? Okay. And then without further ado, I would like to call the presenters from Japan, that are presented by. Mr. Aoi Hirochi from International uh, Japan NGO Center for International Cooperation Genic, as well as Japan Civil Society Network on SDGs. So, Aoi, if you uh, ready, then yes. I'm over to you, Aoi. Thank you, Charles. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Aoi Hirochi uh, from Japan NGO Center for International Cooperation. I also represent the development unit of Japan Civil Society Network on SDGs. So I'm going to present about the uh, impact of COVID-19 and civic space, human rights and SDGs uh, in uh, Japanese society. Let me first uh, begin with the COVID-19 situation in Japan. This is the data as of 4th of November yesterday. The domestic confirmed cases is uh, more than uh, 100,000 
more than 100,000, and they could daily increases 612. And uh, uh, we have total tests, uh, more than 2 uh, million uh, uh, cases, uh, not tests. And uh, total deaths is 1,786. Uh, I think the number is uh, uh, compared to low. Um, however, uh, if we look at the neighboring countries like South Korea, Taiwan, I think the um, case, number of cases and deaths is uh, quite high, uh, I think. Okay, so let's begin uh, with uh, what the impact of COVID-19 on people's lives has and livelihoods and human rights. Uh, in January and February uh, or March, uh, when the outbreak of COVID-19 began to happen in Japan, uh, the access to testing was limited to persons. Uh, and the government uh, introduced a policy to uh, limit the access to testing uh, to persons who had a fever of 70, uh, 37.5 degrees or higher for more than four days. And if, if physicians diagnosed that the PCR testing was necessary, without the diagnosis, uh, people cannot get tested. So uh, this policy uh, limited number of people uh, for the access of testing. And at the same time, the government introduced an active epidemiological surveillance and slings and contact tracing. So uh, this is uh, this led to the denial of the people's right to have uh, access to health and medical services. And why this situation happened? Uh, this is because uh, Japan uh, did not invest more on the public health throughout the 2010. This uh, leads to the shortage of uh, medical staff and also medical resources and also public health centers, budget cuts to local health institutions. And as a result, PCR testing equipment in local public health institutes was not updated. So it was really, really difficult situations, especially in April and May afterwards, uh, for medical workers to cope with COVID-19. Um, okay. Uh, and what was the major impact of the COVID-19 on the civic space and democracy in Japan? Uh, the government declared a state of emergency on April 7th, uh, based on the special measures of the Pandemic Influenza Act. And all 47 prefectural governments requested people to refrain from going out and to restrict the holding of events. There is no, there was no lockdown, but the government and the prefectural government requested people to stay home or to not going outside or having uh, events. There's no uh, uh, complete lockdown compared to other countries, but the people uh, followed the request from the government. And in after the declaration of state of emergencies, people in cities with many confirmed cases, such as Tokyo or Osaka, they were not able to go back to home, to hometown to see their families uh, because there's a strong social pressure from their neighbors. And uh, some people put regulations on safe quarantine for 14 days if you come from cities like Tokyo that have more confirmed cases. And there's also a, a critical uh, uh, impact on access to information. One, and there was a lack of publicity about how to undergo PCR testing. Uh, if you feel uh, a fever or have uh, symptoms like COVID-19, uh, you have to call to a specific uh, cent uh, medical center, but it's really difficult to reach to the center if you make uh, several calls a day and it was not uh, publicly uh, known how to uh, get tested on, uh, how to get tested on PCR uh, testing. And also uh, the, gov the government has restricted the number of journalists to attend the government's press briefing to one journalist per media uh, because of a measure for social distancing. And this regulation uh, have not yet lifted 
So it is really a serious uh, uh, issue is happening for the access of to information uh, by the people. And rule of law. Uh, the government established a headquarters for the control of novel coronavirus diseases, but there's no uh, legal basis. After us, in, on March 26, uh, that headquarters was legalized. So uh, we could say that uh, rule of law was not uh, respected by the government in the first hand. And uh, accountability and transparency. Uh, at the end of February, then Prime Minister uh, asked all schools to temporarily close, but th that decision was not agreed uh, by the Minister of Education, Culture and Sports, Science and Technology, who is responsible for the school administrations. And also, uh, the Prime Minister also announced that uh, uh, the government will distribute uh, uh, face masks to every household in Japan, but we didn't. We do not know uh, yet why this decision was made. No transparency or accountability uh, was guaranteed in the procurement of the masks. And the COVID-19 sustainability subsidies by the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry was also conducted in an opaque and unaccountable manner. So uh, we could say that uh, the government did not follow the accountability and transparency uh, rule. So what is a uh, uh, civil society uh, responded to COVID-19? Of course, uh, many civil societies uh, acted uh, to secure the right to health, right to education, right to food, uh, right to work job or freedom movement. The pictures is taken by the Japanese domestic NPO called Moyai. They distributed foods, uh, emergency goods uh, in downtown area of Tokyo, who uh, are suffering from the economic shortages. And also uh, they uh, offer uh, consultations how to get uh, support uh, from the uh, municipalities. And uh, Japanese civil society also provide international corporations. Uh, this photo is taken by the uh, Taylor Renaissance, uh, Japanese NGOs, uh, providing uh, uh, water and sanitation uh, facilities in Africa. And many uh, civil societies also uh, conducted uh, environmental uh, issues and also gender equality uh, implementations. I, I think due to the limited time, I'll skip these uh, steps. So uh, here are the proposal and recommendation to the government of Japan and the international organizations. Uh, first of all, the Japanese government should lead uh, together with the international organizations for the process of international collaborate, collaborative frameworks such as Act Accelerator and its vaccine partnership COVAX. And all the governments must safeguard to eliminate discrimination, prejudice, misinformation related to COVID-19, and to ensure that all rights, including human rights, are secured. And the government should also establish economic policies in the spirit of SDGs, putting the farthest people uh, first, left, uh, farthest, uh, left people first, and leaving no one behind. And this is the last point is especially for the government of Japan. Uh, the government should establish independent human rights institutions, which are based on universal human rights norms and standards in accordance with the Paris principles, uh, which the government of Japan does not have. And this is a uh, uh, recommendation for the uh, high level political forum and the UN agencies. Uh, as we know, uh, the UN Hybrid Political Forum reviews the implementation of SDGs every year, and we have regional bodies uh, like UNSCAP, and they have to uh, standardize the modality of uh, voluntary national reviews and the country presentations in a more effective manner to follow up member state efforts to implement SDGs in the context of COVID-19. And also the UN should encourage member states to present their next VNR with reflections on the response to COVID-19, including safeguarding human rights and citizens and residents. Actually, 
uh, the United Nations publishes a handbook for the uh, preparation of VNR uh, for the next year. And I hope the government of Japan, uh, when they publish uh, next uh, VNR in 2021, uh, they strictly follow uh, this handbook uh, in preparing and also have a consultation with civil society and also uh, managed to for the uh, partnership. So how can CSO in Asia work together internally, internationally, regionally, and globally to respond to the COVID-19? Um, actually, we have uh, gathered uh, through online uh, since uh, April or May, and we learned so much uh, from each other how to respond to COVID-19 effectively through the multi-stakeholder dialogues and the international conferences by using international frameworks such as Vienna, UPR, and human activities. Uh, actually, this uh, presentation is based on the SC16 and 17, SC16 plus, uh, but unfortunately, SC16 plus is not so popular among Japanese uh, civil society and also Japanese uh, society. So we we'll need to extend uh, this concept of SC16 plus um, among Japanese colleagues. And this Katamandu Democracy Forum uh, provides a crucial opportunity to monitor target country situations of COVID-19. So I uh, ask all the participants uh, to Katamandu Democracy Forum to follow, uh, hold up the monitoring activities in the coming months and the years and present their uh, findings in the coming democracy forums. And we, I also asked the uh, organizers of the Katamandu Democracy Forum to support civil society implementations on the advocacy and campaign proposal at national and international levels. And uh, civil societies uh, organizations should play the role of empowering those on the periphery of society, reflecting their voices in policy decisions, which uh, directly affect their lives. And civil societies also uh, ex should exchange situations and advocacy strategies in different countries and regions to identify common advocacy points and organize international mobilizations. So thank you for listening. That's uh, everything from me. Thank you. Well, thank you, Aoi. I think you, you are sharp. 13 minutes, right? so you're securing two minutes for others. <clears throat> That's from Japan. And then it is my pleasure to call the next presenters and the last as well from center and also from the country very far is to the Asia, from the Center for Human Rights and Development, uh, CHRD. Will be presented or represented by Ms. Urunsot Gombusurens. While you're preparing this, I would like to make these small announcements. I think it's time for us to introducing the Q and A button. Uh, so for you uh, who wanted to launch or want to ask, so I think you have a chance to press the Q and A uh, uh, channels on the bottoms of the screens. Then you can addressing your questions. Fears if you cannot uh, directly speak uh, to asking the question. So we will cap and then I will address things, the questions that written in the bottoms uh, to particular presenters, right? Then once again, for whoever wanted to raise the questions, then you can simply typing on the Q&A button. So for, for Urna, if you're ready, I'm over to you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Thank you, Chair. So uh, I'm very thankful organizers uh, about on this uh, organization of this uh, conference and also very thankful to this opportunity. Yeah. So I want to share about uh, Mongolia situation on uh, uh, impacts of COVID and uh, on the situation of uh, human rights related to COVID impacts, yeah. So I represent here uh, Center for Human Rights and Development as well as the Mongolian uh, CSOs Network on SDGs. 
so uh, the uh, although we have a, a very limited uh, number of registered cases uh, in Mongolia, it's around <clears throat> 350. So all cases are imported and we have no deaths so far, but still uh, we have uh, also very uh, quite serious impact, especially on uh, livelihood of people. So the first thing is, I would say that we had this challenge that we have challenges to, because of lack of facilities for three weeks quarantine, hospital equipment, such as testing temperature or breathing apparatus, protective items and communications infrastructure and so on. And also the food consumption of people, uh, households in households uh, were also uh, decreased, reduced, you know, the, the capacity to, to buy their food. And at the same time, uh, the consumption of food in households also increased because of the uh, staying school uh, children, pupils and uh, uh, children from uh, kindergartens staying at home, they increased uh, food consumption because these food in schools and in kindergartens actually provided by uh, from a, a state budget. And then also family income reduced, especially low-income families were severely hit by the economic slowdown. And for example, female-headed households their income decreased by working shorter hours or unpaid leave caused by economic slowdown and the increase in food prices, including meat, uh, flour and dairy products. And then in the quarter of, uh, uh, and then also increase of domestic violence and uh, domestic accidents involving children. In the first quarter of 2020, the National Police Agency received uh, almost 2,000 phone calls reporting domestic violence, which is an increase of 48% uh, compared to the last year. And also the reported number of domestic violence incidents are extremely unfortunate. unfortunate. And also the uh, and then also it's actually uh, police itself says that it directly related to the current regime. And then also about this uh, incidents, accidents uh, of uh, children, so that for the period of January 1st to April 15, almost 9,000 children of one, zero to 17 years of age were treated at the admissions department of the National Center for Trauma and Orthopedics, out of the high street, 65% was at home. In, in other words, almost 6,000 children or an average of 58 children per day were injured at home places by falls or by bones, you know, because they were uh, left uh, at home without uh, uh, adults taking care after them. And uh, also the uh, education, in education, on education was also we had problem because uh, uh, the, uh, all the uh, school classes were online or on by TV so that this uh, ownership of digital device actually different for people in rural areas and also in poor households. And they are less likely to own computers or tablets and smartphones, etc. So that the only TV lessons were also not very enough for children to, uh, to, 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 to do their lessons in proper way. And then also we have this uh, uh, impact on uh, uh, people's uh, livelihood. So it's, uh, you understand that the economy was very uh, severely hit. And then the most of uh, 
affected uh, were families of young households and also the migrants, migrants from uh, rural areas to cities. They were in, their income was uh, very highly decreased, and then also the consumption also decreased because the their uh, income decreased. And in the first half of uh, 2020, for example, the 79% uh, of legal entities uh, were uh, operating in wholesale and retail trade. So this sector is the one which is the most affected by the COVID. And the uh, sales in retail trade sector, the sales decreased by 10% in comparing to the uh, previous year. And also accommodation sector revenue was also decreased compared to the same period of the previous year. It decreased by 40% and also food service sector revenue decreased by 5.3%. So these are the actually main sectors which provide uh, with job places for people living in, uh, in Mongolia. So, and then next uh, slide, I also want to show very briefly about the uh, uh, impact of uh, COVID-19 on economy. So, as you know, the Mongolian economy is very heavily depends on export of minerals. And then the outbreak of COVID-19 and slowdown of Chinese economy led to decline in demand of mineral products in decline in Mongolia's exports of coal, copper concentrate, iron ore, zinc concentrate in the oil and the overall economic slowdown was in Mongolia. And inflation also reached uh, 2% in August 2020, decreased by 7% points from the same period of the previous year. Inflation is below the central bank's uh, uh, target level 8%, it actually indicated the weakening of uh, economy. And then also the estimated government budget was also, uh, deficit was uh, uh, 2.7 trillion, which is 13% of GDP in the first months of 2020. And uh, the decrease of uh, budget was uh, due to the decrease in tax revenue as well. And also in the first uh, eight months of 2020, the total industrial output increased by 18% compared to the same period of uh, the previous year, mainly due to 25% uh, decrease in mining, in, in mining. The decline in the mining sector was due to decline in coal production followed by 50% decline in coal exports in the first eight, uh, eight months of the uh, 2020. So this actually uh, leaves the uh, country uh, in uh, quite a difficult situation economically. And then also the, uh, the impact of COVID was also on uh, civic space on civic uh, space in democracy and also on activities of uh, civil societies. And local uh, gra grassroots CSOs and CBOs had to stop uh, their activities because of lack of internet connections, computers and skills for online uh, works, you know, because all meetings and you needed to shift off for online uh, mode, online form. And then also uh, very much reduced activities of CSOs working at national level, uh, national level, because of uh, restrictions of uh, public events so that all capacity building trainings, advocacy meetings, community outreach activities and uh, mobilizations were actually uh, reduced. And also the decline in funding opportunities also because of this uh, CSOs in CSOs, uh, voluntary work increased, you know, and uh, they had to work on agent emerging shoes uh, without uh, uh, salary 
So that this was the also one thing. And I think that the only, uh, only humanitarian activities actually could continue in uh, Mongolia uh, from CSOs. And uh, they were uh, able because of INGOs, which actually were, uh, had some projects to uh, provide vulnerable groups with foods, masks, and other uh, supplies. And then also the uh, next slide would show that uh, there was some also, because of this uh, prohibition, you know, the uh, public events, uh, there were really uh, happened uh, uh, demonstrations. But there was one in May, young people, uh, around uh, 100 young uh, people uh, demonstrating against the government inaction. Uh, so they were arrested. So this was is also, you know, uh, the uh, thing. Actually, it's, it shows that the, uh, the democratic space was somehow also very much restricted in Mongolia. And then the cause for this demonstration was that uh, uh, they, they were against the increase of uh, national debt uh, and the debt per capita uh, increased for the last four years for this government uh, by 10 million per capita. So this means that now uh, every child in Mongolia has uh, debt of 25 million uh, Mongolian uh, to Greek. So this was the thing. But the other thing is that the social media platform, which was actually the only uh, uh, channel in the only space where the uh, uh, CSOs were able to uh, do their work. But uh, if uh, uh, look at the uh, condition, so that these restrictive measures actually divided public and social media. Uh, one side say that it's good that the government has such restrictions, you know, etc., because it's just for our safety, etc. But on the other side, they said that it's uh, the uh, the over over uh, over caring measure, which is not necessary because in Mongolia we still don't have local uh, transmission of uh, uh, COVID uh, uh, nineteen. And also the social media was full of news on violence, hate speech statements, and especially on these uh, issues when uh, children were affected by home, uh, at home level, you know, uh, accidents. So they were blaming the mothers, you know, why they leave their children without uh, care, et cetera, you know, so that it was also strengthening this very negative gender stereotypes in, in Mongolian society. And sometimes even we felt that very hard work, uh, which were done by civil societies for many years, by human rights activists for equality and non-discrimination were at risk uh, to be uh, ruined. And also, the, what was the uh, government response? The government response was the, in the very first, uh, in January 27, it actually closed schools and banned public gatherings uh, since uh, uh, end of January. And then in March, it stopped all international commercial flights. And uh, there were only possible uh, chartered flights to bring uh, Mongolians from abroad, you know, which uh, wanted, and every time there were so many people, uh, you know, uh, ending in lines uh, and uh, yeah, because the uh, country was also not possible to bring uh, all of them at once because there were no uh, flights uh, possible. And then also this quarantine facilities as well. And then in end of April, the government introduced several uh, stimulus packages on social protection and also economic stimulus packages. And also the Mongolian parliament passed a law on preventing fighting uh, and mitigating COVID-19 uh, uh, impact. 
And then as of uh, October 14, here I say, uh, uh, here my uh, slide shows that they were confirmed 320, but nowadays it's like already uh, 350, all imported and the fish actually recovered like around 80 or 90%. So we don't have so far uh, this. And then the, it seems that uh, the, uh, the government uh, actually had this uh, whole of government approach, you know, and I think that uh, it's quite succeeded in doing this approach because uh, the emergency commission, state emergency commission chaired by Dep deputy prime minister, and then this commission included all relevant, relevant ministries and uh, agencies, agencies and all, you know. So uh, they were quite uh, effective in doing that. But uh, from uh, civil society side, there was no uh, civic participation. And also there is issue on transparency, on transparency in the accountability. First thing is at least that the in bringing Mongolians from abroad through chartered flights, there was no transparency in uh, on list of uh, uh, on list of people who want to, and then like uh, some uh, claims came that uh, uh, that the government officials actually were uh, taking bribes, you know, to include them into this uh, into this uh, uh, chartered flights. So every time actually they were always like more than 10,000 people. And then in one flight, there is only like uh, two, 300 people. So it was uh, of course uh, big uh, lines there. And then also the second thing is that there were quite of funds uh, collected by the uh, government from different aid organizations, development organizations, and also from uh, domestic uh, uh, private uh, sectors, and also from individuals as well. But the transparency was uh, not uh, really good. And so that's why the, uh, there was also uh, some uh, civil society organizations also did uh, monitoring in the, uh, on, 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 on uh, expenditure. Me, of, yes. If you, uh, if you can wind up within one minute, uh, you're reaching 17 minutes now. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is the uh, uh, misuse of, you know, and then public mistrust. So that what uh, uh, the uh, civil society's response was is that uh, uh, was that uh, of course it's I I, I said that uh, civil society organizations were very much challenged and uh, they had to delay activities and also the increased voluntary work some even closed uh, the their offices. and the only good thing is that they uh, their use of online, uh, technology increased and also improved, you know, conducting different kind of things. But uh, despite these challenges, uh, Human Rights NGO Forum, for, for example, was able to participate in discussions and uh, give submissions, uh, proposals for this uh, uh, new law on COVID-19 and the CSO's recommendations were quite well reflected in that law. And also the uh, Mongolian CSO's network on SDGs also advocated for mainstreaming of SDGs in uh, uh, election agendas of political parties in coalitions for, for the elections, which was held in June 2020. And then also for the uh, to reflect SDGs in new government action program for 2020 and 2024. And then we also continued our work on uh, uh, discussion of uh, non-profit law, draft non-profit law, which was initiated by the government to replace the current uh, uh, NGO law. And also the uh, advocated uh, in, for approval in submission of the draft law on human rights defenders, uh, legal status, etc. You know, so that we were able to continue somehow our all the advocacy 
work. But what we want to recommend to the government is that need to use whole of government approach in parallel with whole of society and whole of SDGs approach. And then also need to follow the principles of transparency, accountability, and to enable CSO's regular monitoring in use of public funds. I mean that why we ask to enable, because legally we may do uh, monitoring of, of all uh, state uh, activities, but enable means that it should be, you know, provided with use of uh, public funds, but not uh, we are looking for funds to monitor the, the, the state uh, activities. And then also to improve knowledge and skills of public servants to work in framework of human rights based in gender sensitive approaches and to implement decentralization policy and enable local governments to play the essential role in localization of SDGs, because this is also very important. And we always see that the um, central government is very far, it is in, in disconnected uh, with uh, the uh, local government. And the recommendations to UN agencies and international development organizations, country partnership strategies of UN organizations and development partners should be in line with the national development priority strategies and performance evaluations need to be discussed at multi-stakeholder forums annually because we don't have this and I don't know how about on about this in how it's in other countries. And also the support the government capacity in building, uh, pol uh, building uh, in capacity building in policy and institutional coherence for sustainable development and localization of SDGs mainstreaming, SDGs targets in development planning, budgeting, and SDGs indicators in results evaluation. Encourage the governments to use human rights based gender sensitive approaches in planning, designing, and monitoring results of uh, program activities. And the CSOs, what we need to do is that uh, CSOs need to learn and share internationally lessons learned and future strategies on advocacy to transform the government approach into integrated triple approaches, whole of government, whole of society, and whole of SDGs. CSOs need to advocate internationally for institutionalization of their participation in national policies and local program of actions in response to COVID-19-like situation and share experiences and learn from each other. And last one, uh, <clears throat> CSOs need to advocate internationally for building their resilience to withstand against COVID-19-like challenges to sustain their functions and resources. And CSOs need to work together internationally to ensure that governments regularly use human rights-based and gender-sensitive approaches in policy and program development in, the res in response to COVID-19-like pandemic or disaster. So that's the uh, end of my presentation and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Urna, for the last present presentation from Philip Hartland of Mongolia. Uh, I think we're completing all this, uh, uh, all the presentation today, seven countries in Southeast Asia and Northeast Asia. I think I have a chance to regulate things, uh, question and answers. Actually, I was like inviting these people to giving to drop the questions, uh, the concerns, or any comments within the Q and A uh, box or, or or tools. I think that there are two uh, immediate questions that written in both uh, tools. I guess one from Rose Trajano of Bahra about the policy medical frontliners, but it was uh, respond by Tat Tat, and also I see some comment from Ted about certain amounts of the incentive provided by the uh, uh, for the medical frontliners. And then uh, you can see on the Q&A or in the chat uh, room. So I don't need to invite more clarifications unless if you uh, feel you wanted to do some things or you want to give very brief explanation about it. Um, among the panelists, you can raise your hands 
or just jump to the questions. But I would like to invite uh, panelists from Cambodia because there are uh, questions from Mr. Budmao Sorn about why the Cambodia report not include um, the minority uh, reports within the presentations. So maybe I would like to call Mr. But, uh, Mr. Uh, Ree. So uh, thank you, sir. Yeah, Mr. Uh, Ree, if you can give just maybe 30 seconds uh, or maybe a half minute clarification on that. And so we can uh, uh, spare the time for others. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, for the ethnic minority in Cambodia, uh, could you hear me, Isha? Yes, yes, I can. Okay. So, ethnic minority in Cambodia becomes the most vulnerable because of the discrimination. You know, um, uh, there is high percentage of uh, Muslim in Cambodia. Uh, uh, tested a uh, positive for the uh, COVID-19 and uh, Muslim community in Cambodia becomes the uh, the hotspot of discrimination as uh, uh, Cambodian, I mean, uh, Khmer people do not uh, uh, show their interest to engage with, for example, in uh, small business or small vendors, street vendors, they are uh, receiving a bad advantage of the uh, information that uh, most of Muslim community in Cambodia receive uh, COVID-19 uh, a positive uh, result. So uh, right now we, 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 we do not have uh, specific information about the impacts of the ethnic minority in Cambodia, but I believe that there is a strong uh, 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 negative impacts, uh, especially in terms of uh, discrimination among uh, uh, those uh, ethnic uh, community. And one more thing, uh, uh, language barrier or gaps of information also becomes the uh, challenges uh, in terms of uh, educating uh, people about the uh, uh, negative uh, uh, impacts of the COVID-19 in Cambodia. Uh, you know, uh, they have different language, uh, they, they have different culture and they live in rural and remote area. So, uh, uh, so it is a bit hard for the government to reach out to them using their own language uh, uh, in order to reuse the information gap. And uh, I think uh, those may be uh, important if uh, the government uh, put more uh, specific measures to, uh, to reuse the gaps of information and make sure that they are, they are aware of the uh, COVID-19 pandemics and also ensure their rights to engage in uh, participation in monitoring uh, and reporting evaluations of the government's mechanism okay. uh, so on and so forth. Thank you, Isha. All right. So is there any other uh, comment from different uh, panelists, for example, like Japan, you have minority concerns over there. <laughs> uh, maybe uh, while you're answering this, I would like to ask uh, to Awi uh, to talk that, to that questions. Is there any concern of minority and how the treatments in Japan? But can you also try to give us some descriptions how the medical frontliners has been treated over there, including what kind of benefits and protection for them? So maybe. Uh, uh, we, we, we got answer from Singapore, also we got answer from Indonesia, maybe it will look like more nice to get from Japan. Uh, I will offer to you. Uh, thank you, Ita. Uh, for the questions about uh, medical frontliners, um, the Japanese government uh, is paying um, a US dollar, 2,000 US dollar to medical workers and employees of medical institutions and other organizations that has been designated by the prefectural government to provide medical care for patients uh, with COVID-19. And another uh, US dollar 500 will be paid to medical workers employees of hospitals, clinics to work in contact with patients. So uh, uh, the medical workers receive uh, additional al allowance uh, from the government. And uh, uh, however, uh, the people uh, who is afraid of uh, infections of COVID-19, um, they tend to avoid uh, close contact with medical workers and essential workers. 
So unfortunately, um, discriminations or avoidance of contact with medical workers is happening in right now in Japan. And for the minority groups, uh, we could say that uh, uh, LGBTI people in Japan have uh, facing uh, severe discriminations on their sexual uh, sexuality and also uh, privacy uh, when they are infected with COVID-19, especially by the local government and also the local media who is uh, tracing the privacy of uh, positive cases of COVID. So it's a great concern from the civil society that the minority groups, including LGBTI uh, groups, uh, their privacy would be exposed. All right. Thank you so much, Aoi. <laughs> it's nice to know. Um, we're still looking and then we're still waiting for the questions from the audience or while we're waiting for them, maybe is there any panelists want to ask one to another uh, something to clarify or some things to, uh, you know, to get more deeper. So we have another, I think, 15 minutes to receiving questions. And maybe if there is none, Um, after, after two hours presentation, I guess somebody is speaking. Yes, uh, it's Tata from Indonesia. Maybe I, I want also add some information on this uh, ethnic minorities and social minorities in Indonesia, which is I mentioned briefly in the presentations that um, yeah uh, there's indigenous people who inhabit areas directly bordering all palm plantations face the threat of starvation, but also that uh, so. The indigenous people have already, uh, some of them already have some kind of mechanism on the quarantine and uh, uh, as a measure to, to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in the community, in the indigenous community. So that's some information on the uh, ethnic minorities. And then meanwhile, regarding other social minorities, which is also uh, impacted is the LGBTQ uh, rights and uh, as well as the uh, so, a minority, religious minority in Indonesia. So I, I just want to mention that. Thank you. All right, thank you. I guess if there is no more intervention from the audience or from the panelists, I think I have to wind, wind up these sessions and then so we can save more times and giving to the uh, next agenda. And then I don't know, uh, should I just return this uh, to the facilitators or call the next um, uh, uh, programs or agenda? But anyway, thank you so much for all the panelists. It was a wonderful uh, lessons experience to listening all the experience, uh, all the contents and knowledge that shared today. And then I will return to Patricia. Patricia, are you still there? Thank you, Michelle, and uh, thank you to, to all the panelists. I think we heard um, a comprehensive um, view of, of, of the challenges uh, that have been faced uh, at the national level regarding COVID-19 pandemic and SDG progress in general. That was very valuable. Um, and we also look forward to hearing more on the thematic reports, of course, tomorrow. But before that, um, let us finalize with the, with the last session. Um, I will give the floor to my friend and Selma Lee, who will provide a synthesis of the 13 reports that have been presented thus far, comparing the findings uh, that many of these CSOs have presented up until now. And Selma, you have the floor. Hey, uh, thank you uh, for the excellent input again today. Um, I'd like to ask Sue to show the result of a uh, survey as we did yesterday. I think we are supposed to do a survey, right? So this is a part of our uh, discussion and also synthesis. So let's begin with the um, result of survey. I'm also very curious whether there's any difference between 
yesterday and today. I believe there are more participants from South Asia yesterday and Southeast Asia today. No? So, so please, uh, can you show the result in the screen? Mm, yes, hold on a second. Those uh, presenters yesterday, today, please uh, show your face. I'm going to ask you to respond to some of the questions. Our friends from Kazakhstan, India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, don't be shy. Election is over, United States, all the shy ADM members coming out. <laughs> so you are all excited about what's happening, not excited, I'm sorry, concerned about what's happening in the United States. <laughs> While we are discussing Asia democracy, we are also concerned about American democracy, <laughs> the big lesson we are learning, you know. Uh, COVID-19. Okay, now, um, okay, this is uh, the composition of uh, participants who responded to the questionnaires. Uh, South, so this time the less South Asia and there will be more Southeast Asia and the more Northeast Asia. Okay, let's go to the next one. The first question, Okay, a little bit slow, like American election vote counting, you know, very slow. <laughs> so we need to organize another session about impact of American election result on democracy in Asia. You know? Okay, so uh, which guru have been economically and socially most affected by COVID-19? Okay, this is a uh, mainly East Asia, which means Southeast Asia and uh, Northeast Asia. The top one was the migrant workers and followed by medical staff and children, older person, person with a disability. So can you give me your comment? Those who made a presentation, is, is it um, same as your country uh, trend in terms of trend? You know, as we discussed yesterday, we are not saying you know, this is more important than others. So this is a perception, you know, it's not very scientific. Just we use this one as a basis for our discussion, you know, clarification. Uh, so please show in the screen. Some of you highlighted very much, you know, the medical staff, especially Indonesia and Philippines, very surprising. You know, many people, you know, those who are working to, to treat patients, they were, uh, you know, infected, you know, and then some of them died, you know. And so medical staff was, I think, number two, and the migrant workers, obviously, you know. And this also same as South Asia, right? The mainly, but unlike South Asia, South Asia, we have an incoming and sending country, right? Singapore is incoming, right? Receiving, uh, receiving country. So nevertheless, especially Singapore was a very clear case. Any comment on this result? Based on your own country uh, experience and data, you can give some comment or clarification. Yeah, can I? Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, you see, I, I actually uh, I see that the uh, results uh, shows quite a similar situation. You know, it expressed quite similar, uh, which is in Mongolia. So, for example, children in youth, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, in Mongolia as well. And then also women, you know, like because of this uh, uh, stopping, closing uh, schools and kindergartens, you know, children, children's, you know, uh, staying at home, becoming quite not safe for them. And then also for women, you know, the closing all schools and kindergartens uh, increases their burden, you know, and mm. also they have to live, you know, this economy and uh, uh, without income, etc. You know, so that, yeah, I think that it's quite uh, similar. Yeah, yeah. You know, it shows actually the situation yeah. in Mongolia. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, you are right. You know, the UMOS was number two. It was the bottom. I couldn't see, you know, sorry. You know, I couldn't <laughs> mention, I did not mention about women. You know, women was in fact number two, 39%, because a lot of domestic work, you know, the, you know, home, all the overburden again because of coronavirus. 
And also there are a lot of, uh, we call Corona blue, right? Corona blue, you know, psychological stress, you know, and domestic violence. You know, you have to see, I'm going to show later on the draft, the Kathmandu Declaration, where we are going to put all our ideas and observations. So you have to cross check. So remember the perception, visual of this uh, perception test, and then when you read the uh, draft declaration later on, so you can see the connection, you know, between this one and our final uh, declaration. Okay, so can you please show the next one? If no, no more comment. Let's go to the next one. So I think it's... Uh, so, uh, so Okay, so human rights. Here you see that there are some civilian political rights, economic, social, cultural rights, you know, all kinds of human rights. Let's see which one is the top. Freedom of movement, freedom of movement. I think predominantly Indonesia and Philippines, you know, many people still locked down, you know. And then what's the number two? A right to work, because many were dismissed. They lost their jobs, unemployment. Number two and number three, right to education, children. I think right to education, almost no exception, right? Almost every country. How is the right to education in Cambodia? Relatively Cambodia, you know, Thailand, and relatively better than other country. But still, I think children cannot go to school, right? So that means almost every country in Asia you know, right to education, especially children, they were heavily affected. And then, any comment on this result from yes, your own Jawa. country? Yes, please, Philippine. Yeah, actually, uh, I think I agree, freedom of movement. We have one of the longest lockdowns or quarantines as we call it here. So it also actually affected the uh, work by CSOs mm -hmm. and uh, by curtailing the movement of people. Mm -hmm. we, as I've said earlier, it's, it's, it's quite a long and uh, very strict lockdown here in the Philippines. And it affected mm -hmm. a lot of other things, mm -hmm. including freedom of assembly okay, and food, right to food, right to education. So it has a, it has a very, very strong effect on all the other uh, mm -hmm. uh, things here, no? aside from uh, the freedom of movement. So it has a chain mm -hmm. reaction. After. Yes, right. Freedom of Assembly Association, it was a number, number four. After this uh, right to work and also, um, I think right to education. Any other comment on this result? You know, those who made a present yesterday from South Asia, you also welcome to join this discussion. If not, let's go to the next question, number four. Slow. All right. What do you think worsened COVID-19? We uh, changed a little bit the questions to so make it more relevant to our discussion. So uh, this is about uh, causes of the COVID-19 and also what are the factors that made things worse by COVID-19. Which one is the top? Top is uh, economic social inequality. This is a top followed by lack of transparency and freedom of information, and extreme poverty and hunger. These are the top four. So any comment on this result? Um, yeah, maybe I want to make some comments uh, until mm. more. Yes, please. Yeah, on the economic and social inequality, uh, it is, I think it's everywhere and that's why it uh, it reached the highest score that 
uh, especially it exacerbates the impact of COVID-19 uh, to the vulnerable groups especially. And then here, I also want to make a comment on the lack of transparency and freedom of information because uh, I, uh, even though the government has already released like daily uh, number of cases and also number of deaths and so on, but still uh, there's kind of doubt on the reliability or the validity of information of data mm -hmm. because the data management is not uh, reliable here in Indonesia. Uh, there are many deaths which is undocumented and also uh, undocumented cases also uh, is everywhere. So that's why uh, despite the high number, we still kind of uh, uh, doubt the, the, the number. Okay. So the discussion of data management, quality of data, which is also very important in SDG, you know, the last target of the SDG was about data, right? Data transparency and monitoring. Any other comment? Uh, yes, please. Um, I found that the uh, excessive urbanization is uh, higher mm -hmm. uh, compared to other desertifications or climate change. And uh, we see many examples of uh, confirmed cases in urban areas, even in Asian uh, countries. Mm -hmm. I think the urbanization has a, a strong relationship with uh, COVID-19 uh, outbreak. And also in urban cities, we see economic and social inequalities, um, the rich and poor in urban areas. And uh, if you're rich, you can have uh, uh, protection measures from COVID-19. But if you are not, uh, it will hit you very hard. Okay, thank you. As you know, we are going to have a semantic presentation tomorrow. One of them is about this inequality and then uh, freedom of information, misinformation. So um, uh, it will be very helpful. We'll have a more deeper uh, discussion on these questions. Any other comment on this result? So we also have um, someone in the audience who would like to speak. So I think oh, yes, it would please. be okay yeah. to give yeah. them a chance. Yes, so we please. have Laxman Busnet. I'll go ahead and give you the floor. If you can make your statement very brief. Okay. Okay. Hello. Hello. Okay. Yes. Yes. Please. I'm Laxman Busnet from Kathmandu. I work for South Asian Regional Trade Union Council, okay. which of 19 unions of six countries in in the South Asia. So what we understood is uh, um, the lack of leadership. We are so together uh, that uh, the South Asians should have come with one plan, so that we could. These are the these are the uh, what you have on point number four. What you have said is 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 a long process, but immediately all the governments should have come together and do one action, so that it would have uh, stopped this. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, stop the um, um, spreading the COVID-19. I mean, from India, it came to Nepal. From Nepal, it went to other places. So I think it was a lack of leadership. Though we have a South Asian Regional uh, Association of the countries, and at one point, the government said that we will work through that, but did not materialize. But if we, if we could have taken one action in South Asia, uh, one point of view, I mean, somebody says that, okay, close down, somebody says open it. So that's not that's not right. Some, somebody says, okay, this is the right way. The other one said that, no, we should have worked together so that these are the in here the, from climate unsustainable consumption of production to lack of international rule and law. These are a very long process, but immediately all the government heads should have come together and take one action. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your input. Okay, any more comment on this question? If not, we can go to the next question.
Okay. Uh, our colleague from the Nepal, the trade union, he just mentioned about this political leadership. So now, what do you think are the most important factors in responding to COVID-19? This is our response, you know? because depending on your perspective, COVID-19 is, um, some say it's a man-made disaster, but this is a, uh, still this is a controversial, but nevertheless, what has happened, happened. So now different countries respond different way, you know? and we have a, now see the different result. Why, why is such a, different result and why some countries are failing, you know? So number one factor is a political leadership. Okay. And then number two, citizen participation. And, and then number three, we have a two, cooperation between central and local government and medical institutions and infrastructure for public health. Okay, any comments? This is a very interesting result. Can anybody clarify what does it mean by political leadership? Uh, can I say something? Uh, yes, please. Um, as of my understanding, if I understand correctly, political leadership is always the driving force in the country to make a decision and policy for the implementation of any activities, not only related to COVID, also other activities, government activities at level. For example, if the political leadership is very strong, they can just make a cooperation between central and local governments. They will uh, communicate and uh, trust building activities. And uh, they also engage all the citizens and welcome most of the participants in the, in the program. And also they manage all these medical institution and infrastructure, anti-corruption, inclusive and uh, public awareness and education. All of the uh, things which we are just kept in this uh, in, in this uh, questionnaire, that is always be driven by the political leadership and political decision making process. That always support for mm -hmm. all these activities to function uh, mm -hmm. at, the, at the country to just uh, implement any development activities in a sustainable manner. That is yeah. my view. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. I think these are. Um even more clear in other continent, Europe and United States, you know, this are the question of political leadership, you know, these are one of the key factors in many countries, but Asia too, you know, many countries. Any other comment? Very interesting, there also cooperation between central and local government. Can anybody comment on this one? Is that that serious? Can it be the major factors? The lack of coordination? Um, Until more? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, it's Sarah from Indonesia. I want to make a comment on that uh, cooperation between central and local government. Yes, that in Indonesia, the uh, it's not conflicting, but it's very much. It, it we can be we can see that there's kind of clash uh, policies between the central and local government, especially between the uh, central governments and the provincial government of Jakarta, which is the capital city. In terms of the lockdown, uh, to, to, to decide uh, lockdown or not, and which facilities can open and not, there's always some kind of uh, debate between uh, the, uh, the supporters of the central government and also the, the uh, provincial government. Meanwhile, for the other provincial government or the local governments, they kind of very loose in terms of uh, implementing the health protocols and also uh, other uh, measures. So that's why uh, this mismatch between central and local government is very much problematic and adding uh, more prolonged COVID-19 pandemic in Indonesia. Okay. So when there is a, you know, different directions by central and local government, but local government has a very, um, they know about ground reality, but they don't have a power, right? They don't have a financial power in you know, all the powers with the central government, but they do not understand the, what is happening really local reality, you know? So these are the only dilemma. Any other country also similar problem? Okay, Indonesia, what about Philippines and others? You have also, because, you know, local democracy is a, one of the important, uh, you know, the area for democracy movement in Asia. So some countries we are making progress. But if people have a very negative view about local democracy as a source of conflict, this can be also obstacle, you know, for our future 
the democracy movement. So I think that's why this is very important. If this is the case, why? How can we fix this problem? This can be also important the task for civil society. You know? Because some of us are very much can in I? the local democracy. Can I? Yes. yes, please, Kirana. Yeah. Uh, Uruna? It's Uruna, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think that it's, it's uh, I also actually uh, choose the, this uh, cooperation between central and local government is one of the most important okay. factors, you know. Why? Because I feel that uh, there is no really good uh, coordination and coherence between co uh, between local and central governments, you know, because I think that if you want to uh, really implement SDGs and bring people SDGs to benefit them, so that the 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 this role will be played only by a local government, you know. So in this regard, the policy on decentralization is very important, so that the local government should have their own uh, power to make decisions and also enough funds, you know. And then also it sh there should be also cooperation with people, you know, this, uh, uh, this uh, participation, civic participation. And uh, uh, Mongolia actually adopted the decentralization and uh, local governance uh, policy in 2016. But unfortunately, this uh, strategy is not implemented yet, uh, even though there is uh, the elected uh, national council and then this uh, local governor, but still the between these two also not very good uh, uh, not very good, uh, I would say, cooperation, you know, uh, sometimes even they may compete, you know, for, for, for power. And uh, so that's why, you know, that's mm -hmm. why, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So question of decentralization. I think if you all agree, we can put this one as a, one of the, our common future activities, you know, how to strengthen local democracy as a way to respond to similar disasters or a similar epidemic next time, you know? So Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And then what about, anybody can comment about citizen participation? Mm -hmm. Anybody from Singapore? Is Ted, are you still around? Are you in the room? Mm -hmm. Singapore is a very interesting case, mm -hmm. very different from other countries, neighboring countries. So from these uh, factors, uh, Ted can, or anybody from Singapore can give us a comment <laughs> or insight about uh, Singapore case. Uh, I think Sammy is in the room, he can talk about okay, it. Okay, please. No, you can comment, but uh, I wanted to comment on the, um, the central and local government actually. I was thinking of that before I comment on Singapore. Give me a minute, is it okay? Oh, yes, please. Yes, feel free. Yeah, from the experience in Indonesia before, during the tsunami in, a, in Aceh and others, the problem was very clear that provincial governments were given certain autonomy, but they did not have the capacity. And I still think they do not have the capacity. What was said earlier is all right, even Urna and the Indonesian delegate or uh, reporter. I think the major problem, the incapacity, they don't know what is governance how to manage the resource and they end up corrupt. A similar experience with migrant workers' resources and money in Philippines. Even when money was sent to the central government was supposed to be allocated, they are unable to um, uh, actually deliver and uh, perform. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I do not want to elaborate. Tomorrow I can say if you want, but also in the Mekong countries, the same problem. Okay. So your proposal to train them in terms of governance, in terms of practices, in terms of... Uh, uh, what is good governance, for example? Yeah, you yeah. know, when it comes to project administration, even international organizations may give money, ILO, IOM, but they are unable to do, and they, these countries or these international organizations have their, their staffs there. Okay. Uh, in terms of Singapore, you are asking something on um, what, what were you asking here? Sorry. Uh, civic part citizen participation. Uh, well, basically, it's zero because they don't want, except party people. Uh, okay. to participate, I mean, the ruling party, you know, uh, and they have get very antagonized, even if the right now they're very educated, very experienced people in the workers party, very youthful. Uh, mm. You can see that the stale mindset of the ruling party people, even if okay. they are young, uh, they mm. do not agree to right, move yeah. forward. Yeah. 
Sorry. Okay, thank you. I think the citizen participation is uh, one of the key issues that we are really, you know, trying to address. Uh, as we may remember, this uh, international debate between Europe and Asia. Correct. Some yeah. critics from Europe said Asia successfully managed, you know, the COVID-19 because totalitarian government, authoritarian government, or people are simply obedient, you know, they do not exercise their own right, you know. So very poor human rights, you know, the consciousness, this is one of the factors, according to some experts in Europe, you know. So this is a big question. And whom from Nepal mentioned in the chatting room, public obedience. Is it citizen participants? Is it obedience? We just follow what government told us to do? Or what is the effective way of citizen participation? You know? But Singapore result is not bad now, but you said there's no zero, zero participation. Uh, what does it mean? You know? What does it mean? You know? This is a big <laughs> question about democracy because I'm going to show later on soon correlations between impact of COVID-19 or result of COVID-19 and democracy. Is there any correlations? Better democracy means better result or result has nothing to do with the democracy or civic space. <laughs> this is a big question we need to discuss collectively. You know? I don't agree with that point because in Singapore's case, the males especially, especially are brainwashed from a very young age. First, you are Asianly, you are very obedient to your parent, you're told to be obedient, even for whatever in Singapore multicultural is the same. But okay. the moment they are young people at 18, the military takes over and brainwash them completely, loyalty to the party and to the government. Yeah. So that is why I say the participation often, if they are part of the say 60% voted for the government, 65 something, uh, they uh, do not have their own discretion. They don't know what is human rights, firstly. Yeah. For example, uh, just one last example, 20 years ago, when Think Center started, they thought we were bad people because we are talking human rights as Western uh, perceived knowledge or Western perceived values. But later, it is not true, no? Yeah. Okay, Sammy, yeah. All right, thank you. So I think what you said is, uh, the civic participation is linked to also public awareness education, you know, Correct. people yes. need to be aware of, you know, our human rights, democracy and so on. Mm -hmm. So let's move to the next question because we are going to the conclusion or um, and the synthesis part. The last question, please. There's actually two more questions. Uh, two but, more questions, yes. yes. Last two questions. Okay, thank you for so feel free to write down in the chatting room. I can read chatting room so that you can participate in our discussion. So there was an interesting comment from chatting room, the Ray uh, Gaspe. Political leadership for me, it means to make or break in the fight against COVID-19 release on the leaders. Sadly, some leaders are weaponizing COVID-19 to control their society. You know? So, so COVID-19 can be, a, of course, it's a challenge, but it can be opportunity to, to strengthen participatory democracy, but it, at the same time, it can be uh, excused by some authoritarian government to curb, you know, or impose more authoritarian rule, you know. So did, you have a two sides of the coin. So please show the screen. The last questions. Oh. Okay, so I'm going to show the last question first um, yes, and then the other one later. Hold on a second. There's also another interesting comment from chatting room while waiting for um, the result. Cooperation with the government is a great idea, but dangerous move will be cooptation of CSO. That means chances of swallowing of CSO agenda by government. So this is also another reality. No? In the name of participation, this is a cooptation, you know. So this is also another challenge. Okay, question number seven: the which civil society action were most effective in responding to COVID nineteen? So there are five options, five choices. First one is aid assistance, direct action. There was no uh, service delivery by government, so CSO is a forefront in providing assistance. This is number one. And then number two, accountability, transparency, governance. <coughs> Any comment on this one? There are four choices. Of course, these all are important. 
I want to stress once again, you know, this does not say, you know, this is important than others. All are important. We do certain things because we have a division of labor among NGOs. Some are more service delivery, some are more on advocacy. But according to this uh, perception survey, this number one was aid assistance. Any comment on this, this one? Kirana from Indonesia, you look very serious, contemplating. <laughs> uh, your can you hear me? Yes. Oh, I think the top two of the answers show it reflects what CSOs here are doing. Actually, we de we dealt mostly with um, providing assistance, food assistance, like in my presentation, um, providing community kitchens and distributing to the um, informal workers who are affected by the restricted restriction of freedom of movement. Also, um, we are also pushing the accountability and transparency of government response as it is very minimum here. So I think um, uh, the top answers uh, actually reflect what uh, we are doing here. In mm, yeah. So aid assistance does not necessarily only the food, but also legal assistance. Yes. This is very important, yes. right? All kinds yeah. of the practical assistance, you know, because it's yeah. an emergency situation. So that's why the assistance is a top priority. Any other comments on the result of this question? Yes, Anselma. Yes, please, Renato. Well, as much as we would want to, aid assistance is something that I think CSOs and NGOs are naturally uh, doing uh, in terms of uh, working with communities that they're, you know, they they have as partners, but in 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 uh, in the Philippines where there's very strict lockdowns, and uh, both this uh, aid assistance and accountability and transparency, I think, should be at the forefront because uh, there are billions and billions that's being poured in at a very short period of time, and if these things are not delivered in a way that should benefit the people then and nobody else is looking at how it is being done then i think we will have a greater problem okay. so i think this is something that uh, the, the two top questions should be something at the forefront in terms of what cso should do yeah i think this is a very good comment combining both aid assistance and accountability and transparency you know whenever there's a huge international aid there's a huge corruption you know and then another problem of inequality, you know. So I think we need to have really have a critical eyes about this uh, international aid and also within uh, domestic aid as well, you know. So maybe uh, you can help us to formulate one recommendation uh, to uh, so-called international development agencies. As I said in the first day, we have a JICA, COICA helping a lot, you know, sending a lot of international aid to the country, but all those aid ODA, it was really effective on the ground, you know? So I think this question we need to continue to raise in our discussion and also uh, follow up. Okay, um, so this is the last question, right? Is there any no, more questions? No, we have one more. Oh, one more question, yes. Let's go to the last question and then we go to the synthesis with the draft declaration. Somebody eating something, you know, I can hear. I feel hungry because it's a seven o'clock, Japan and Korea, it's a time for dinner. <laughs> All right, this is the last question. What do you think should be priority for civil society action in responding to COVID-19? Wow, many choices. Uh, can you show the bottom, Sue? We have a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight multiple choices. So I, it, it didn't allow me, but the last one is independent monitoring of the impact mm. of COVID-19 and that's 20%. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So these are the results of the last question, priority for civil society action. Again, this is not very objective because depending on your priority, because each organization has already a priority, right? Advocacy, service delivery. So nevertheless, this shows, you know, variety of actions we are taking now, you know. 
to understand who is doing what. And then, of course, it has to be combined. There should be a synergy you know, between different approaches and different actions. Anybody wants to make a comment on this one? The top one was monitoring of government policies and their implementation. This is what we discussed before, right? The Renato stressed very much, you know, the transparency of aid, transparency of policy, and so on and so on. If no other comment, let's go to the concluding part. Uh, so uh, uh, I want to show my PowerPoint again. Do you remember yesterday I shared with you uh, PowerPoint data, the uh, data and trend in Asia. And I want to show now again to you after 13 country presentation, whether we have a different view, you know, different perspective. Okay. Um, Can you see the data now? Can you see in the screen? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, so this is um Okay, so this is um 13 countries in our project. So now I want to share my own observation and then with the, and then i want to raise questions for our common discussion and reflection okay these are 13 countries and we are going to have a thematic discussion tomorrow inequality dalit migrants disinformation and refugees but today we focus on the country 13 country so i want to show once again data and trends in asia okay so this is the result Okay, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and Northeast Asia. This as of first of November. And then this is also another data in terms of number of deaths per 1 million. As we discussed yesterday, Asia is much better than other continents, much better than Europe and Central America. That does not mean we don't have any problem. We have our own problem internal problem, governance problem, as we discussed uh, yesterday and today. And this also another data, total number of uh, cases and deaths. There, there are big differences among Asian countries within sub-regions. As we noticed yesterday and today, South Asia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and then Sri Lanka. So there, we have two types of countries high number of the cases and deaths, and then low number, you know, two groups. So we can divide into two groups within South Asia and then within Southeast Asia. You know. Obviously, Southeast Asia, we have Philippines and Indonesia. And then Northeast Asia, not much difference. You know. So let's focus on South Asia and Southeast Asia. And this was another data. This is a per million the previous, previous one was total number of cases and deaths, but this is the average you know, per million. But South Asia, Maldives is the top, followed by India and Nepal, you know, India and Nepal. You know. And then Southeast Asia, Singapore is the top, and then Philippines, Indonesia. So we have two types of pictures. If you use the total number and then average number of the cases and deaths, for one million. And then we have a Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, you know. So now, do you remember this, uh, the map, political map, civic space index? It was shown yesterday. We have a two countries, green, narrow, obstructed, and uh, repressed and close. Is there any correlations between the result of COVID-19 pandemic and the civic space index. So this is a general question. Okay, think about it. And then these are the three questions we can discuss further today or also tomorrow. As I said, any connection or correlation between COVID-19 and democracy? If yes, if not, we can discuss the next question. And the second question is how COVID-19 pandemic been affecting democracy and civics in your country? 
what are common and differences. So I, after listening to 13 presentation, I'm sure you have some in mind, you know, oh, these are the common, these are the differences. So some of them already I put into the Kathmandu declaration, which you are going to discuss soon, you know, because we cannot put all the different issues, but mainly the common issues affecting democracy and civic space in Asia general. And the last question is how CSO can respond to COVID-19 more effectively, locally, nationally, internationally. Okay, so, so this is the three questions we have in mind when we drafted uh, this Kathmandu Declaration. So now I want to show with you this Kathmandu Declaration. Already it was shared with you yesterday, and then we got some input and comment yesterday, today. So this is a revised version um, today for further comment. And then it will be revised again tomorrow morning, and then we will adopt tomorrow afternoon at the closing session. So these are quotation from this is a word from UN Secretary General, as you are familiar with this. He said very clearly, it's not it's a public health emergency, but it's a far more, you know, as we discussed the yesterday and today. It's an economic crisis, social crisis, and human rights crisis or governance crisis. You know? So these are the content of our. Kathmandu Declaration. So let me show some key substantive the paragraph, which can be considered as a summary or synthesis of our your presentation and our discussion. You know, and then there are two uh, paragraph about multiple causes of COVID nineteen and also factors that exacerbated the impact of COVID nineteen. This is from our own discussion and also your presentation. So you can take a note. If you want to make any comment, you can do immediately after this presentation, or you can send your opinion in writing so that I can incorporate your input into the final draft. Okay, so these are the two about causes of COVID-19 and the major factors that affect the result of COVID-19. And this one is the first part, impact of COVID-19 on people's lives. So there are six paragraphs. So this can be summary of your presentation. I pick up some keywords from your presentation. Number one is a, one is a general, especially we highlighted domestic and gender-based violence because some of your report really uh, highlighted, you know, the serious problem of this uh, gender-based violence. And number two was the SDG, related to SDG in terms of emergency management. Number three is about migrants. So this is from the report tomorrow. As I said, there will be a presentation about migrants and also refugees and also Dalit and also inequalities. So this is a summary of uh, presentation tomorrow. Next one is impact of COVID-19 on democracy and civic space in Asia and beyond. There are only four paragraphs. I'm sure there are more. I get a lot of um, the input from your presentation today, particularly Southeast Asia. But this is a summary based on yesterday input. I hope you can contribute more. The first one is a shrinking civic space. Second one is a cyber attack and misinformation and disinformation and serious human rights violations by some country, probably I think the Philippine case, extrajudicial killing. You know? And then also we want to show our support for people struggle for democracy in Thailand, Hong Kong. These are the four, but I'm sure there will be more, you know. Next one is Asian government response to COVID-19 pandemic. There are eight paragraph. Is the first one is, as some suggested, we want to also show um, some governments are doing good job, you know, making progress in combating COVID-19. So we want to acknowledge some positive steps. And also we want to remind uh, all the government, everybody about good guidance from UN, especially human rights based approach and also WHO guidance and also government responsibility, paragraph number four, 
And number five is a partnership with the civil society. Number six is a international solidarity and cooperation. Number seven, and the debt issue, you know, the debt issue. Some of you raised this issue in your presentation. And number eight is a human rights institutions, role of national human rights institution. Some of you mentioned about uh, this issue. So these are the eight summary, but I'm sure there are more, you know, so you can uh, make an intervention about what more need to be in this uh, government response. And then now the so concluding parts, proposals and recommendation. So number one is um, Uruna also highlighted the importance of whole of government, whole of civil society, whole of SDG uh, approach. So first one is human rights based and gender transformative in line with the SDG. You know, these are the general framework. Number two uh, is these are triple approach. Uh, Uruna mentioned. Number three, a resilient strategy. Also linked to decade of action. And number four, global system education and human rights education against xenophobia and hate speech and discrimination, racism. Number five, is a multilateral uh, policy coherence, particularly multilateral development agencies or financial institutions in the recovery process. And then number six, inequality question, more take pro progressive measures to combat uh, inequalities. And the digital right, I think this is incomplete. We need to fix this one. So uh, digital right question and the vitalize the regional cooperation. As some of you mentioned, ASEAN, the SAC, SAC is sleeping. We need to wake up the SAC to operate more effectively within South Asia and also the Korea, China, Japan, you know, the Northeast Asia and others. And then lastly, there was an interesting suggestion yesterday, the Human Rights Day, 10th of December, we continue to monitor from human rights perspective and publish and then use as an advocacy tool, you know. So these are nine concrete proposals and recommendations. Okay, now, so these are the key substantive issues based on your presentation and the discussions. So I'd like to invite you to give the comments on the content of this uh, one, the Katuman Declaration as a way of doing the synthesis. Okay, can I invite one by one to give the one comment, one one contribution before we finish today, you know, so that I can uh, put your input into this uh, uh, revised Katuman Declaration. Okay, may I invite Inkara? Are you happy about you, <clears throat> all your concerns, ideas are reflected, of course, not all, you know, the major one reflected in the declaration? Oh yeah, thank you very much, Anselm. I think it's uh, quite a comprehensive document. And uh, yeah, I saw some of our suggestions. Uh, and yeah, I think it makes sense uh, for the region, uh, quite comprehensive and uh, covers a lot of uh, issues, not only for the democracy, but like health issues. Yeah, so I think it's, uh, I think um, we don't have much to add, but yeah, gender, um, health issues, inequality issues, um, transparency, everything is mentioned. Yeah, so thank you very much. I think it's a great okay. contribution. All thank right, you. thank you for your comment. So let's go one by one. Uh, Gopal, you look also very serious. Gopal made a lot of contribution to the drafting process, as we all know. So nevertheless, we have a new input today from Southeast Asia. Gopal, micro, microphone, please. Oh, hang on. One minute. Let me show you the proposal recommendations in case you want to make a reference to... Okay, uh, sorry, I think uh, there was uh, some problem with the microphone. Uh, is it okay now? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, sorry. Oh, can you hear me? All right. Yes, uh, on the... Uh, on the... Uh, okay, this uh, seven... Number eight, mm -hmm. uh, as part of the proposal and recommendations. Yeah, since we are uh, mentioning uh, 
the ASEAN, SARC, and Japan-China ROK Trilateral Summit. I think there is even a bigger uh, initiative in this part of the world. I think we must not miss out, you know, to mention that particular initiative called BIMSTEC. BIMSTEC yeah, okay, yeah. is the Bay, Bay of Bengal initiative for multi-sectoral technical and economic cooperation. In fact, uh, 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 just for information that it covers Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Myanmar, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Thailand, and brings together about 1.5 uh, billion people, 25% okay, yeah. of the world population. I think so. In terms of uh, you know, uh, in terms of you know the 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 regional regional grouping, because it it is going to uh, in a way uh, displace Shark one day. That is what the observers are you know telling since the very beginning. So I think we should we should. What I mean to say is that Wimstek. Uh, should also be mentioned as part of this. Okay, yeah, thank you. No so please uh, send in writing. So I don't remember all the countries belonging to BIM, BIMSTEC, okay? Any other comment from the right. audience, Sue? So yes, we yes. all we have- Can you invite? Um, yes, please. I'll have Rose, um, she raised her hand. Uh, Rose from Philippines. Yes. Okay, Hello. Rose, please, yes. Yes, uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, welcome, Rose. Yeah. That was uh, a raise hand earlier, about mm -hmm. uh, 40 minutes ago. Anyway. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Okay. Uh, I do not know uh, if we can uh, add somewhere in, in the document about a unified or a more strengthened uh, health approach in the ASEAN region. No? Okay. Because we, of course, it's, it's the European and the Americans who have this very advanced scientific knowledge on uh, virus, on infectious disease, on pandemic. But I think it's about time that Asia also develop its own uh, uh, specialty no? or, or specialization on, on, on this type of uh, uh, concerns. No? That's mm -hmm. one. And another is one issue here in the Philippines is actually, and this is also being uh, mentioned by the by the Philippine president, no, uh, the concern about vaccines, no. Vaccine. Uh, of course, most of the countries in Asia are not that rich; <laughs> many are poor, and uh, we are afraid that not all of us can get the vaccines, which will uh, normalize uh, the whole world, no. Uh, we have we need to have substantial vaccines, especially in Asia, where most of the populations are the biggest population in all the uh, uh, continents, no? But uh, because we are mostly poor countries, then it would be an issue. So I think uh -huh. uh, if that can be included, uh, an Asian approach to pandemic, building its own capacity, and then uh, equality or equitable <laughs> and yeah. distribution of vaccines. Yeah. Okay. So, Lord, thank you very much for your contribution. In fact, vaccine was mentioned in the paragraph number six on oh, okay. the Asia okay. government. But nevertheless, please uh, give us in writing the wording. So I'll put your concern into the statement. So we have a one or two more participants, right? Who wants to make an intervention? Mm -hmm, that is correct. So yes, I'll also yes, give can, them. Can you invite them? Yes, and uh, before, uh, I'll also put a link in the chat room uh, where everyone could access the document mm -hmm. um, and give us their uh, suggestions right. for sections. So I'll put that in the chat room. Thank you, thank you for reminding. Because you can make uh, your own comment in the online, right? We already sent out the link about this statement. Okay, so who is the next? Uh, we have Deepak Dakal. Okay, Deepak Dakal, please. Please introduce briefly yourself, from which country, which organization. Okay, so I'll just move on to the next person. Yeah, please, yeah. Um, and meanwhile, the Tata, can you give me the wording about local government? But somehow that is a missing, you know? So I want to really highlight, you know, role of local democracy and then importance of the local government. Okay, we have uh, Trilok. Yes, please. 
Trilo, you have a floor, please. Yes, uh, yes. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. This is Trilok Chand Vishwas BK. I am the national president of Nepal National Dalit Social Wel Welfare Organization from Nepal. Uh, so regarding this uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the uh, 7 million uh, people of the Dalit community who are the very uh, below the poverty line and the, who have not uh, shelter and the many uh, problem and the economically uh, very poor. Uh, so uh, so uh, the, what is that uh, uh, our uh, some of the incident uh, told that uh, some of the our Dalit community uh, people uh, died in, in the hospital without treatment and without care, without any tablet uh, uh, by the hospital in the Tharai province number two, that is the, we have a very uh, uh, sad uh, things. And the, another thing is the, uh, uh, this, uh, in the, even the, in the pandemic, uh, they have uh, no uh, access, uh, they have uh, not uh, 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 access, accessibility, uh, who are the very, okay. uh, they have uh, no information, they have uh, not uh, no sufficient um, access uh, to get the uh, relief or, uh, uh, or uh, some, uh, you know, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, this, uh, regarding this uh, COVID pandemic, yeah. uh, health issues or the information, yeah. so, so on. So this okay, is, yeah. The, yeah, this is the things uh, in, right, yeah. our, uh, for in our country Thank we are you. facing. Yeah. yeah, and we are working uh, yeah. against uh, this uh, discrimination. Okay. Thank you very much yeah. for your input. Thank As you. you know, you know, this uh, Kathmandu Democracy Forum, we are organizing in partnership with the ADRF, Asia Dalit Rice Forum. So there will be a presentation about COVID-19 from Dalit's point of view. Please, uh, welcome. Uh, you are welcome to join. So tomorrow's session, so we then have a more in-depth discussion about impact on Dalit and also how Dalit so can, together with the civil society, respond to COVID-19. So uh, paragraph five of this chapter is about uh, yeah, it's about Dalit challenges facing the Dalit. So thank you for your comment. So let's go. Uh, any more comment about general comment about this um, Katuma declaration? So um, obviously, I was not able to cover all the issues raised by you, but these are the common issues I believe. You know, but nevertheless, if you want to really highlight certain issues which you believe is not only your country but many other countries, is a common challenge. Please. Now is the time. To uh, Anselmo, uh, yes, Anselmo one, from, yes. yeah, just one recommendation in the proposals, if you can put on the slide. Yes, uh, Yes. if you could kindly include uh, the need for protecting and promoting civil society organizations who are working around COVID-19 and uh, making sure that governments make available financing for them. All right, uh, yeah, civil society. Uh, yeah. Yes, civil, I think uh, that should come uh, in the proposals and recommendations because if it's a civil society agenda that we are coming, you know, we should be coming out with an agenda that is purely uh, talking about us also. Yeah, yeah. So if we can uh, include it somewhere. Yes, uh, definitely, definitely, you know. Thank you for reminding, you know, because all the because some CSOs are crossing down, you know, <laughs> because the lack of funding and another restriction and so on, you know. So I think we have to put clearly, you know. Uh, okay. So may, may I add something? Yes, please. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's actually for proposals to government um, mm -hmm. that uh, under any circumstance, uh, there are mechanisms for people to participate in decision making mm -hmm. and not making um, a pandemic or a lockdown uh, a okay. reason for not uh, letting people participate. Uh, people's participation, even in the situation lockdown, you know, yes. the right to participate should be yes. guaranteed and protected. Thank you for reminding. Okay, any more comments? Anselmo, there's one point that I wish to say. Yes, please. I think the, the point of, I think it may have come in the reports. I didn't hear the word solidarity. Basically, okay. I think there's two things linked to that. One is the value that people believed in and the make this, um, and prepare to make the sacrifice either for their family for the community and uh, in a wider community too. Mm -hmm. So this is also the reason, not just the government's brainwashing the people under authoritarianism, but the people themselves have this concept of solidarity or 
concept of um, respecting the family and the community you know, at large. Okay, yeah. So yeah. And they're willing to make the sacrifice or the needed um, measures for that, you know. I, okay, I think that yeah. needs to come somewhere, yeah. Yes, that's why, you know, we discussed once social distancing, but it's, it's not uh, physical distancing, but more social solidarity, right? Correct. So, uh, COVID 19 should be the opportunity to build social solidarity rather than government control, you know, right? Correct. Yes, thank you for reminding. So, let's highlight that one. Of yeah. course, we need to have an effective government. That does not mean more government power to control, no, no. you know? Totally to agree. Social solidarity, you know? Thank yeah. you. You understand okay. what I'm trying to say. So, thank you. Th thank you for raising that issue. It's not only Singapore, you know, many countries, you know, almost no, all countries in Asia. No, no, I'm talking about, no, no, I'm about yeah. Asia. I, I think there's right, a yeah. general a trend. It's not a physical, emotional attachment. It's more than that. You know? Right, right, right. Yeah. Value. So, may I invite Patricia? You are in Poland, right? You may have a different perspective and different wow. experience about COVID-19. So, could you just give us some comment on the content and also your view from far away, outside Asia? Well, I certainly think it's a, it's a challenge that's being presented throughout the world at this moment. As I think many of you who have been following the news recently, we've seen how cases have been um, going up exponentially here in Europe. Mm, so right. mm. there's a series of ongoing um, lockdowns or minor, not full lockdowns that many countries are putting in place at the moment. So we'll have to see what's what's happening, but we're certainly in, in this uh, second wave of the pandemic. Uh, and here at the Community of Democracies of the Permanent Secretary, we do continue to work. Mm -hmm. We're here, like I mentioned today at the office, but it's only myself and another person. Um, but you know, democracy has to continue. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think I wanna thank everybody and uh, for the presentations today. It certainly provided a very good overview of the of important challenges uh, that countries are facing mm -hmm. um, in the region, and also some opportunities and important recommendations that were presented and how both CVSOs can continue working uh, through this time, and and also important recommendations I think for the governments that we're certainly taking note of that. And thank you, Anselmo, for, for the very good overview and synthesis now of 13 reports that have been presented both yesterday and today. Um, and, and this very good overview as well of this uh, draft declaration, the Kathmandu Democracy Forum. As it was mentioned before, there's still some time uh, for you as participants um, to provide comments and any input uh, regarding this declaration that will be finalized and presented, of course, mm -hmm. tomorrow. We invite you also to join us tomorrow in the last day of the Kathmandu mm -hmm. Democracy Forum, where we will be hearing from civil society organizations that will be presenting thematic regional reports, as mentioned before, also by Anselmo. Uh, following the thematic reports, we will have a synthesis and of course we will finalize with the presentation and adoption of the Kathmandu Declaration. So we look yeah. forward to you. Uh, we look forward to having you tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Patricia. But can I ask one more question? Not as a secretary of uh, COD, but as a global citizen living in Poland, in Europe, you know, we are now discussing our challenges within Asia, but you are the only one outside Asia. But as I mentioned, there is a, some politicians in Asia saying, you see what is happening in Europe. They are very proud of human rights and democracy, but they all are failing, you know? So we don't need democracy. We don't need human rights, you know? We need to have an Asian ways of managing, which is, very little to do with the democracy human rights. So some of us, are, it's, a, it's a real debate, you know, a discourse, many countries in Asia. So how do you understand from your point of view, as I put in the question, correlation between democracy and human rights and COVID-19? You know? How do you see as a citizen living in Europe, how you see the, what's happening in Asia? Well, um... Like I said before, I think uh, that certainly today I, I heard from many challenges that have been 
noted in countries in Asia uh, regarding restrictions that have been put in place because of COVID-19. And I think one thing that we need to, to keep in mind and consider is that, of course, democracy is very important. And whenever, and we understand that countries need to put emergency legislation in place as they have done throughout the world. But this emergency legislation also needs to, to be based on human rights, on democracy principles, mm. and, uh, and, and not put that aside. So it's very important, the role, I think, that civil society is playing right now, especially in Asia, of providing, of, of monitoring uh, government responses uh, regarding how COVID-19 is being addressed at this moment. Um, as a person that's living right now in Europe, um, I have to say that I can only speak about, about Poland at this time since I'm, I'm living here, but I can say that um, information that is being provided has been, has been quite useful. Mm -hmm. um, I have felt safe here. And even though restrictions have been put in place, um, I believe it has been um, quite useful at this time. So, um, like I said, I, I can only speak about a moment <laughs> at this time, but I think uh, okay. there's many challenges that are confronting every country. And um, I'd like to hear more about some of the possibilities and also good practices that we can put in place. Yeah. Um, right. Ask for recommendations that can come out of this forum, of course. Yeah because we're focusing a lot of the challenges that are presented mm -hmm. uh, right now, but I think we need to look forward to, to how, and have this discussion on how we can build back better mm -hmm. after the yeah. pandemic. Yeah, yeah. And we still believe that, uh, of course, democracy and democratic practices, and uh, for example, the Warsaw Declaration principles are building blocks to build democracy better right now after the pandemic. So it's gonna be very important uh, to take a look at that, um, to consider always um, to make sure that we ensure uh, that democracy is strengthened in these countries and that uh, support is provided as, as was mentioned just now, a support continues to be provided to yep. civil society on the ground that are doing this very, very important job as we have, as has been mentioned today. Okay, thank you very much, Patricia. Keep yeah. safe, we'll meet again tomorrow, right? So we have a more discuss, in-depth discussion because until today, we have collected 13 country presentation, but we are going to have a regional perspective you know, from the perspective of vulnerable people, most affected people, you know? And then we can have a better picture of what's really happening in Asia, you know, on, under this COVID-19. So thank Absolutely. you very much for your contribution. And let's discuss more tomorrow. Any more comments, final comments today? Of course, we can discuss tomorrow, but today on this um, summary of our international the comparison. Um, Anselmo. Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah, responding your uh, request, I have put the suggestion on the chat box. Oh, yes, uh, chatting room. OK, thank you very much. Okay, if not, uh, is it uh, Ichal, Sue, can you give us the final comment before we close? Um, thank you for staying with us for four hours. It's <laughs> tough, it's very tough, but uh, we, we still have a lot of people here with us. Uh, that's it, and we'll see you tomorrow. Uh, there's also a different link for tomorrow, so please make sure you register for that. And mm -hmm. use that in and definitely join us again for the thematic uh, overview tomorrow. Uh, yeah. So once again, uh, those who made the presentation yesterday, today, you are all invited to read at least one paragraph tomorrow closing session. So you have to be all there tomorrow. So we'll divide the work among ourselves. Okay. So uh, good evening. Have a good day. And then see you tomorrow. Thank you for your participation and contribution. Let's give a big hands. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.